Good evening. I'm calling the organizational meeting of the Arlington School Committee to order. Uh, today is Thursday, April 14th, April uh, 2022. It is 6.22 p.m. I'm Paul Schlickman, President Pro Tem of the committee. Uh, my job is to run the organizational meeting. Uh, permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me when I call your name. Please answer in the affirmative, noting that many of the folks here are in person as we are hybrid. Uh, Mr. Thielman is here. Good. Dr. Allison Ampey? Here. Uh, Mr. Cardin? Here. Uh, Ms. Morgan? Mr. Hainer. Here. Dr. Holman. Here. Uh, Dr. McNeil. Here. Mr. Mason. He's uh, in the building. Ms. Elmer. Here. Uh, AEA Rep. Sif Ferranti is not here. Student Rep. Amy uh, Chalaria. Hi, Amy. Uh, Hi. Tonight. Hi. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted in a hybrid model. On February 15th, 2022, Governor Baker signed into law a new section of law um, extending certain COVID-19 related measures. The new law, Chapter 22 of the Acts of 22, includes an extension until July 15th of the remote meeting provisions of the Governor's March 12th, 2020 executive order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with the agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely or as a hybrid, so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, the meeting is being conducted via Zoom. It is being recorded and is being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus agenda platform. And finally, each <coughs> vote tonight will be taken by roll call. And let me find the agenda, which I had open a second ago. And now I'm required by policy VEDL to read the land acknowledgement. The Arlington School Committee shall, um, <clears throat> we acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located in the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Ma Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. And now we'll entertain nominations for the office of chair. Mr. Hainer. I nominate uh, Ms. Exton for chair of the Allenton School Committee for 22-23 uh, school year. Do I hear a second? Uh, hear a second. Any uh, further nominations? Hearing none. Roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Uh, Mr. Hainer? Yes. Dr. <laughs> right. Uh, and uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. And, uh, and I vote in the affirmative. It is a seven nothing vote. Congratulations. We now entertain uh, nomination election for the office of vice chair. Mr. Hainer? Uh, I nominate uh, Mr. Schlickman for vice chair for the Arlington School Committee for the year 22-23.
Do I have a second? Second. Do I hear any other nominations? for the position of vice chair. Uh, Dr. Allison Nampy is my nominated. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, do I have any other nominations? Hearing none, I'll deem nominations to be closed. I will offer Dr. Allison Nampy and myself both an opportunity to make a brief statement. Dr. Allison Nampy. Okay. I have been looking to be vice chair since last year when I set up, when I signed up for secretary. Um, looking ahead at that time, I saw the year 22, 23, and then the chair year 23, 24 is especially important. Um, three things in specific were the things I was really thinking about. First, um, I thought that um, Ms. Exton being new, in her third year as school committee and new to governing the entire body might appreciate backup if she so wished and I was wanted to be there and prepared to do that. Second, I wanted to give our superintendent, Dr. Homan, support in her third year as superintendent. Um, and third, next year, there is a lot of work that the vice chair is going to need to be doing in terms of conversations, work with long range planning, working with the town towards figuring out how we're going to fund both town and schools in the years to come. And this is something which I have been, I've devoted the past year thinking about and I'm ready to take the next steps in terms of having those conversations. Um, I did not realize at the time I had uh, put my name in for vice chair that my esteemed friend and colleague, Mr. Schlickman, was going to put his name in also. Um, I mean no disrespect. I am continuing a course that I had set forth a year ago, and I still, it's one I feel very, very strongly, and it's only because of this that I would ever think to try, not to, to inadvertently step on someone's toes. So, thank you. Thank you. I will make a statement. Um, as long as I've been a resident of the town of Arlington, we have rotated chairs on this committee. Uh, the select board has a different but similar procedure in which they rotate chairs. Uh, this was our policy until about 10 years ago, and the reason why the policy changed was that we had a contentious 5 to 2 committee. There were lots of difficulties with that committee. And th that resulted in having a members of the two-member minority leading as chairs of the committee from which they had no support. That was the reason for uh, making an adjustment to the policy. Nonetheless, we have continued with this uh, custom ever since. This will be the first time in over 30 years that this committee will have De deviate from the custom of rotating the chair. The reason why this is important for the committee is that it eliminates divisiveness, it eliminates politicking, it ins eliminates inside politics by which we have people organizing for the purpose of becoming chair. That's not a healthy situation for a committee and we have fortunately been able to uh, avoid that problem. We have all worked together as members uh, of this committee. Uh, in the 23-24 school year, all six members of the committee will have served after my last term of chair, so in the normal rotation, this would be my opportunity to lead. Nobody in this committee is spectacular enough to be uh, a permanent chair, nobody on this committee is somebody I w we wouldn't have confidence in as a chair. Uh, w in that circumstance, I would urge my fellow members of this committee to observe the tradition and not go down a road to contested chairs every year by following the 
uh, tradition that we have had in the past. Any, any other uh, discussion? Mr. Hainer. I came on the committee 11 years ago. Uh, I was an outlier at the time. I was welcomed by all the members at that time, and I think it was three years later I became the chair with all the support. I think everything that Dr. Ampey was talking about is to be considered, but I also have faith in all the members of this committee. Both the new members on the committee have had the support of the other members at all times. Whenever a question was asked, people have been there to support, and if they didn't have the answer, they directed somebody there. Uh, the norms that we will be sharing in a couple of minutes, I think, exemplifies this camaraderie, this support of each other, and I support the idea of continuing rotating the chairs on a regular basis. We, uh, it works. It, it's not broken. Thank you. Any other debate or discussion? Hearing none, a roll call. Ms. Exton. Um, am I, I'm choosing a person. Yes. Okay. Dr. Allison Ampey. Mr. Thielman. Dr. Allison Ampey. Myself. Mr. Cardin. Abstain. Ms. Morgan. Dr. Allison Ampey. Mr. Hainer. Mr. Schlickman. And, and I vote for myself. We have a 3 3 vote. With that, I will declare the uh, office of vice chair vacant as we have failed to elect one. Do I hear nominations for the office of secretary? I nominate. Yes. I nominate Mr. Thielman. Do I have a second? Second. Do I have any other nominations? Hearing none, uh, all in favor of Mr. Thielman as secretary. Uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Th uh, Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Uh, Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I vote in the affirmative. Um, Excuse me. Yes. Might I suggest that uh, we leave this issue for the night and revisit it at some time during the year? I'd ask the new chair to consider that going forward. I, I think we need to do that. I, unless uh, anyone would like to make a motion to reconsider the vote, I see no point in repeating. If I may? Yes. I, I think we need uh, some time. Uh, to think it and uh, just at some time the chair uh, bring it back and think it up. Thank you. Motion to adjourn? Uh, oh, no, no, no. no. I'm sorry. Uh, we, have the, we have two other motions before us. Um, uh, actually, three other things. Just, just a sec. Go ahead. Um, I thought that if we had a failed, if any member failed to receive the majority that we were supposed to solicit nominations again? I see no point in going through. We have a failed vote. Um, if we would, if anyone would like to make a motion to uh, revisit, go ahead. I guess I would, I would ask if any of the people that have voted would ch consider changing their vote. Mm -hmm. I, am, I, will, I, I will declare I am not going to change my vote. I would ask if any of the people who voted would explain their rationale. Uh, I rule that out of order. Um, we've disposed of the vote. We can uh, bring this back up later. I've declared it vacant. And, and unless there's somebody who was, wishes to change their vote uh, by indicating that so right now, I'll just declare it vacant and we'll move on. Vote to approve committee and liaison assignments. The uh, newly elected chairs provided us with a list of proposed assignments. So move. Uh, motion by Mr. Hainer, second by? Second. Mr. Cardin. Any comments or debate? Hearing none, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Thielen? Yes. Dr. <laughs> Allison Ampey? Yes. Uh, Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. 
Mr. Hainer. Yes. And, the, and I vote in the affirmative. That's a seven nothing vote. That is unanimous. Uh, vote on the authorization of chair in alternate to sign pay, payroll warrant. I need a motion to authorize both the chair and the chair of the warrant committee, which would be Mr. Hainer, to be authorized to sign the payroll warrant. So move. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Mr. Cardin. Uh, roll call vote. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Uh, Mr. Hainer? Yes. And uh, the chair <coughs> votes in the affirmative. Um, and now per policy BDA-E standards and norms of the Arlington School Committee, uh, by uh, policy, the newly elected chair shall read this aloud to the committee and solicit our signatures, which are attached to an email uh, to a DocuSign document so we get everybody. Thank you. We, the Arlington School Committee, acknowledge that a school committee meeting is a meeting of school committee members that is held in public and not a public meeting and that we will make every effort to ensure that meetings are effective and efficient to that end. We acknowledge the importance of subcommittees and we and the superintendent agree to utilize them to focus on specific topics in depth and to prepare for presentation, deliberation, and possible action by the school committee. We, the Arlington School Committee, set forth these standards and norms that we will all commit to abide by as individuals and as a committee. One, represent the needs and interests of all students in the districts. Two, exercise leadership in vision, planning, policy making, evaluation, and advocacy on behalf of the students and district, not in managing the day-to-day -day operations of the district. Three, conduct our business through a set agenda. Emer Emerging items will be addressed in subsequent meetings through agenda items. Four, provide full disclosure. Each member will provide input, encouragement, express concerns and positions rather than withhold information from other members. When a committee member feels that there has not been full disclosure, an objective process for revisiting the issue will be used. Five, maintain an open environment where each member is empowered to freely express opinions, concerns and ideas. Committee members will work together to clarify and restate discussions in order to strive for full understanding. Six, keep an open mind and accept that they can change their opinions by recognizing that they are not locked into their initial stated positions. Seven, make decisions on information and not on personalities. Committee members will act with the best information available at the time considering data, the superintendent's recommendations, proposals, and suggestions. Committee members will strive to make the best decision at the time. Eight, debate the issues, not one another. The committee will engage in critical thinking, expecting all committee members to freely offer differing points of view as part of the discussion prior to making a board decision. Nine, not take unilateral action. A committee member's authority is derived only through a majority decision of the committee acting as a whole during an open public meeting. 10, attend meetings well prepared to discuss issues on the agenda and be prepared to make decisions striving for efficient decision making. 11, strive to have no surprises for the committee or superintendent. All members will receive the same information on all topics in a timely manner. 12, strive to reach decisions by consensus. Discuss with respect, disagree without acrimony. When consensus is not possible, all members will publicly abide by the majority decision. 13, understand and respect the chain of command as it concerns roles and responsibilities and direct others to do the same. 14, review and revise our standards and norms as needed as part of the committee's self-evaluation. Thank you very much. Uh, we have now concluded the business of the organizational meeting. Um, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn, Mr. Hainer. So move. Uh, looking for a second. Second. Moved by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Cardin. Roll call. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Uh, Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Uh, Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I vote in the affirmative. It is a 7 nothing vote. We are adjourned. And I will now pass 
the gavel on to our newly elected chair, Ms. Exton. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we're going right into this next meeting. Mm -hmm. so. And thank you for the script. Thank you. Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, April 14th, 2022. I'm Liz Exton, the newly elected chair. Um, Mr. Slickman did our, our uh, remote meeting script, so we don't need to do that anymore. So uh, the next thing, or the first thing on our agenda is public comment. I'm going to read a little bit about public participation before um, inviting our community members to have signed up. For members of the public who wish to address the committee, there will be 20 minutes of public comment. Depending on the number of people who sign up, time allotments may be reduced but will not exceed three minutes each. One of my committee members will be the timer and will give the speaker a signal when they have 30 seconds left. If the number of people who sign up exceeds what can be done in 20 minutes, the number of speakers may be capped and will be invited to speak based on the timestamp of their email to Ms. Diggins. The school committee respectfully requests participants of the public to utilize their camera if possible while speaking and to adhere to the public comment policy BEDH that requires participants to provide their name and address. Speakers may offer such object objective criticisms of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel nor against any member of the school community, except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as the operational leader of Arlington Public Schools. The public is reminded that the school committee does not hold jurisdiction over the performance of school personnel other than the superintendent. Additionally, the committee will not hear anything that might identify and or infringe upon a student's privacy by name or incident. If you would like to sign up to speak, please email ediggins at arlington.k12.ma.us by 12 noon on the date of the meeting. We have six people signed up for public comment this evening. Um, Dr. Allison, Ippie, can you be my timer, please? Um, we have three here in the chamber, and then we have three on Zoom. Our first speaker tonight is Ine Huang. Didn't expect to go first. Here we go. Good evening, school committee members. Uh, my name is Ine Huang. I'm a, a longtime parent at this point and also the chair for CPAC. Uh, I'm speaking on, on behalf of the HGI committee, wherein um, I was an a active participant, and I want to say that we did some really good work, and I feel that not only is the school ready to do this, but the teachers who have led this charge are absolutely ready to do this. So I, I say that uh, heterogeneous should be a go. On top of which, uh, as, as a chair for CPAC, I'd also like to state that we are in full support of uh, Allison Elmer in this new role that I think you're voting on later today. Uh, so I wanted to just state that out in public. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Julie Zelmer, which said it might be over Zoom. Julie Zelmer, are you here? No, she on Zoom. Liz? Liz? She on Zoom? Yeah. Okay. Well, well, we can go to the next person and then come back. Uh, Rachel Turkington? Good evening, Arlington School Committee. My name is Rachel Turkington, and I am a parent of a seventh grade student at Audison and a first grade student at Brackett. I am also a middle school math coach in Waltham Public Schools, and I have served as a K-12 math director and taught middle school math for a total of 17 years. I have extensive experience helping teachers successfully differentiate to meet the needs of students in a heterogeneous class. I have also conducted research and analyzed an abundance of data about the negative effects that tracking has on students. I am here tonight to support the pilot of the heterogeneous classes in ninth grade ELA. I believe that creating a heterogeneous class in ninth grade ELA is one step in the direction of creating more equitable outcomes for our students. Decades of research have repeatedly shown that tracking, 
which is placing students into leveled classes, is harmful to students enrolled in the lower track. And it provides no significant advantage to the higher track students. Tracking is an inequitable practice that disproportionately harms our students with learning disabilities, our low-income students, our Latinx students, and our black students. Even when students are allowed to choose their class, the lower track class is overrepresented with the aforementioned student groups. Students who are placed in the lower track often experience feeling less confident in their abilities as a learner and are often given less demanding work. The combination of feeling less capable and receiving less demanding work results in lower achievement and can affect how a student sees themselves as a learner for their entire educational experience. Instead of lowering the self-esteem and expectations for our most vulnerable students, we have the opportunity to set high expectations coupled with high support for all of our students. Learning in a heterogeneous classroom can enhance the learning experience for all students, even our highest achieving students. The teaching and curriculum in a heterogeneous classroom is not watered down. The curriculum that is used embodies the grade level standards, rigor, and high expectations. The teacher plans, supports, and scaffolds to ensure that every student can reach the goal of the lesson while also planning more complex tasks to ensure that students who are ready for more are challenged. This model of instruction is called universal design for learning and all students benefit from getting extra support when they need it and extra challenge when they need it. The majority of teachers are trained to teach in this way in their teacher preparation programs, from kindergarten teachers to AP teachers. As every class will contain students with varied needs and therefore every teacher must differentiate regardless of the level of the class. After listening to some of the ninth grade ELA teachers, reading the proposal, and listening to Principal Janger, I am fully confident that this team will deliver, is, am I? Yeah. Okay. Can oh, I can finish, okay. Yeah. Um, I am fully confident that this team will deliver a high quality curriculum with the appropriate support and challenge within a heterogeneous class. In conclusion, um, I think heterogeneous classes give students an opportunity to learn with and from students of different cultural backgrounds, different learning styles, and life experiences. Learning in a more diverse classroom helps students value the perspectives and contributions of people who are different from themselves. If our community cares about creating a more inclusive... Sorry, I'm gonna, we have a lot of speakers, so I'm going to stop you. Thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you. you. Um, Claire Abbott, who I think is on Zoom. Miss Diggins. Yep. Yes. Great. So, good evening, Dr. Holman, Chairperson Exton, and members of the school committee. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you on the topic of heterogeneous grouping at Arlington High School. My name is Claire Abbott, and while I co-signed a letter of support with many other parents detailing the myriad of reasons we believe this is the right thing to do, both academically and morally, I'm here tonight on behalf of my three children who will be running through the halls of many Arlington schools for the next 12 years. Um, if you've seen them, you've noticed my fifth grade son's really tall stature, his ready smile, his happy-go-lucky attitude, um, but you might have also seen him hide his head in his hands during class, avoiding conversation. Perhaps you got a glimpse of my third grader's purple hair when he dashed by you on the basketball court, or you saw him chewing his lip in anxiety during a spelling test. And some of you might be lucky to know my kindergartner, her effervescent smile as she skipped by you, so proud of learning how to read this year. These three kids are more different than they are similar, and the proposal before you tonight to create heterogeneous classes in ninth grade ELA courses will ensure that each of them has the same opportunity and the same access to experience rich, standards-aligned, engaging instruction. No leveling, no tracking, but rather inclusive and dynamic classes where teachers can intentionally make connections to and build upon students' knowledge when engaging around the same rich texts or critical thinking questions. Students' diverse and cultural linguistic backgrounds become assets to the classroom community and to the learning process. They build one another's knowledge and awareness while preparing one another to become more engaged and active citizens. And when it comes to academic achievement, Arlington's teachers know how to help students thrive. This model will make it easier, not harder, for teachers to provide engaging, standards-aligned instruction 
to every student by providing teachers with additional common planning time and giving them the, um, the flexibility to adapt and adjust in the moment to meet the learning needs of each student. Students will also be empowered to take charge of their own learning trajectory with the ability to choose honors level learning expectations, all within a richer and more dynamic classroom environment. Finally, it is not insignificant that this pilot would launch in our English language arts department. Literacy has and always will be the foundation of a thriving community. As Koichiro Matsura wrote, quote, literacy is inseparable from opportunity and opportunity is inseparable from freedom. The freedom promised by literacy is both freedom from, I get very passionate about this, both freedom from ignorance, oppression, and poverty, and it is freedom too to do new things, to make choices, and to learn. I encourage Arlington, Arlington to embrace this opportunity to do new things, to make choices, and to learn. For my three kids, and for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Sarah Barton. We can. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, I'm a Pierce parent and also the CPAC co-chair. My name is Sarah Barton. I'm speaking in support of heterogeneous grouping. Before you vote on the pilot tonight, I want you to think about the message that APS would be sending to students if ninth grade English continues to be tracked. To the students tracked to college prep, we're telling them before they even set foot in the high school or know what an honors class feels like, that we don't think they're capable of achieving at the same level as the majority of their peers. Or we know that they are capable, but maybe they need a co-taught model or some other accommodation that's not available at the honors level right now. So we're telling them as a school system, as a, as a community, that we're unwilling to put in the time, effort, and resources necessary to give them access to the most challenging content. And what are we telling our honors students? That because they possess a specific academic skill set and they hail, statistically speaking, from traditionally supported demographics, that they have no need of their peers' perspectives, that their growth and development as learners is predicated on excluding underrepresented voices. These ideas are not the ideals of our community, nor are they of benefit to our students. I urge you to approve the pilot proposal so that we may begin the work of disrupting unconscious bias and structural racism, ableism, and classism so that our traditionally marginalized students see what they can accomplish rather than what they cannot. And our brightest students are freed from the constraints that block them from the valuable contributions of all of their peers. The research supports this move. The teachers support this move, and so do I. Um, and much like my co-chair for the CPAC, I would also like to um, put my support behind the new position of Assistant Superintendent of Schools for Student Services. Um, as you'll be hearing at an upcoming meeting from our um, recent CPAC parent survey, uh, a major struggle that parents have is to get consistent communication and accurate information between and among departments. And I really feel that this reorganization has the potential, if done well and with sufficient resources, to break open some of those silos and foster a more coordinated approach. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ramona Nichols. Can we do speaker view on this so we can better see the speaker? She was here. She, she was, was there. there. Yeah. yeah. She was just here. <clears throat> yeah. Did she go into the attendees? But it's just tough to see people in the squares from this distance. We have to, we have to find her first. Yeah. Turn off her screen. Her. Um, raise her hand. Well, yeah. My concern is she's in the attendees. Yeah. yeah. Ramona, if you're in the attendees, can you raise your hand? Oh, there oh, she here is. She, oh, she had to go some. No, I didn't. I didn't okay. Is this her? Sorry. I'm in a vehicle now. Um, 
Good evening, Chair Exton, Dr. Homan, and members of the school committee. I'm here to share my support for the heterogeneous grouping initiative pilot proposed for all ninth grade ELA. As a parent of a black, uh, <laughs> A black child, elementary aged in Arlington Public Schools, I've recognized the challenges with respect to teacher bias and the pigeonholing of children that starts at an early age. Studies have shown that teacher expectations do not merely focus, I'm sorry, do not merely forecast student outcomes, but they also influence those outcomes by becoming self-fulfilling prophecies. Systems and policies that would put all students on the same footing in terms of how teacher expectations are formed would be helpful to narrow those attainment gaps. When I first heard about this plan, admittedly my thinking was this should be started at the elementary school level. And I was worried about the watering down of high school curriculum, perhaps unintentionally disadvantaging some of the communities that we're seeking to support. Everyone here has a different personal frame of reference and mine is that of a black child who was bused to better schools in white suburban neighborhoods to access a more challenging curriculum than my neighborhood districts provided. Leveled education benefited me perfect, per personally and allowed for significant academic success that I don't believe I would have achieved had I stayed in my neighborhood schools. Many black and Latinx students coming to this district are also looking for and expecting the ability to choose more challenging courses that will ultimately allow them to be successful in their studies beyond high school. I was surprised to see that minority students were not electing these courses in Arlington. And while I don't know why that is the case, I think we need to take a multi-directional systemic action in addressing those disparities. This should start at the elementary level and there needs to be continuous dialogue about educator bias and real work on shifting the mindsets and educator expectations around advancing their educators to provide a more multi-tiered approach to education differentiation within a classroom. There's a noticeable gap in our ability to differentiate at all levels in APS. And I believe our educators need more training and experience in that regard. That said, I made an objective of having an equal playing field at ninth grade level, whereby each student can gain footing as a freshman and then choose honors and or AP curriculum in 10th to 12th grade, makes a lot of sense. I've taken a curious perspective with respect to this proposal. I've asked many questions, viewed community videos, proposals, FAQ, and asked questions of our Arlington Public Schools leadership about the plan. This has helped me to clarify some of my, my own misperceptions about what was being asked. I was not aware that there are no fundamental differences in the curriculum, the texts, and the, in the honors versus the A-level courses. There's only a difference in the student experience and instruction. This was shocking to me, and I do believe that tracking students early in their high, high school career in such a way does not facilitate choice. I appreciate the thoughtfulness that has gone into this, asking students what they want and the educators what they're committed to doing. Even attempting is extremely important to me. If the educators want and the students want to try this, I think it's on us to allow for this pilot to take place and let them try. Many of the concerns I've Ms. heard- Nichols, we're gonna need you to wrap up, that, please. Not a problem. Um, we just need to ensure, we also need to ensure that we have the salaries training to make this teaching model successful. Um, and there's no single action that will help Arlington. And this is just one step towards working towards a strategic, strategic goal of making Arlington Public Schools an equitable and inclusive district. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Julie Zellmer, is she in uh, Miss? Oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Jill. I have a few things to say because you've already seen what I've written. So I'm a fan of metaphors, and when I think about the way in which we're trying to imagine and recognize what we're trying to do here, I think for ninth grade English, it reminds me of a climbing wall. And if you think about a climbing wall, there's a lot of different ways up. There's different paths. There's angled paths. There's straight up. There's all kinds of ways you can get up. Everyone's going to get to the top. Some people might go straight up. Some people might go diagonally. Some people might have a disability. They're still strapped in. The teacher's got them. But they're all going to get to the top. It's not a race. It's about intelligence. It's about it's, not, it's about skill, it's about learning. It's about practicing and failing, and maybe falling, but the belay's got you. That's what I want you to think about when you're thinking about how we're gonna scaffold for the students in the same class. They should be in the same class. They should be on the same climbing wall. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, we had 
two other speakers who requested to speak, but our current policy is that um, speakers need to request to speak with Ms. Diggins um, by noon. Um, so I think in the interest of being consistent, we're, that's gonna conclude our public comment. Um, our next item is our AHS student representative to the school committee, Amy Shalaru. Are you here, Amy? She was here too, I don't know. She's here. Mm -hmm. was just she may not, may not have heard you. Amy? I don't see her as a thing either. <laughs> well, we can go on and come back. Do you see her in the, in the list, Ms. Diggins? Yeah, she was here. Search yeah. for her name in the search bar, please. Liz, type her name in the search bar. No. Okay. So our next item on the agenda is the 2022 Virtual Influencer Award and highlights from the K-12 library programs this year. Dr. McNeil. Thank you very much. So to introduce the library team and Stacy Kitsis, who was the recipient of that award, we have our Director of Digital Learning, Rashmi Pimprakar. So I'm gonna hand it over to her so she can begin the presentation and so that we can celebrate uh, Ms. Kitsis. Stacy, can you share it? It's uh, it's disabled. I need somebody to enable it. We we are working on that right now. Thank you. A moment of peace is wonderful. Wait time. Bless me. I like your background. <laughs> Thank you. Try to share right now. Try one more time. Still no. Stacy, can you send me the the presentation? I have it, don't I? Yeah, just try to oh wait, I think I'm gonna. Okay, but Ms. Diggins, she, she's gonna enter. once you introduce, uh, yeah, Ms. Diggins is gonna need to. You're gonna move. have to unpin her, unpin Rashmi. All set? I think you need the slider between the two screens. Is that vertical bar? And she can unpin her. Unpin All the way to the left. There, there's a vertical bar. You can see the little bit of the presentation down, down, down. Go to the letter E and slide uh, for everyone. See the everyone? Uh, up, 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 up. See where it says everyone in the middle of her screen there? But okay. Well, does that mean the people on Zoom can see this slide? Yeah, they can. They're not seeing this. No. Screen. Once they okay. they're seeing the other view that's hidden. They need to unpin her. But we can look here. Sean, which one do you see? That one. Stacy, can you uh, advance your slides? Yes. There you go. 
Okay, we can go back to Rashmi, you can do the introduction, and then Stacy, you can start. Um, good evening, and thank you, um, Dr. Hillman, Dr. McNeil, um, honorable members of the school committee, and all present for this opportunity to talk to you. Um, to begin with, we just want to uh, take a quick second to wish you all a very happy reading as we celebrate the School Library Month. Uh, with me tonight um, are Stacy Kitsis, our wonderful Arlington High School librarian, Liz Phipps Herrero, and Jennifer Lachlan, who's our K-8, uh, who are our K-8 librarians. Um, and we are very delighted to announce that this week, with your support, uh, we added a new K-8 librarian, Renee Nichols, uh, formerly the library paraprofessional at Pierce, who's currently completing her library certification at Salem State University. She's unable to join us tonight, but is very grateful for the school committee's ongoing support of the library department. Um, now I'll turn it over to our wonderful high school librarian, Ms. Stacy Kitsis, uh, who was recently recognized by the Massachusetts School Library Association as the 2022 virtual influencer for her complete transformation of the high school library, um, library website and library, of course. Um, Hardy's congratulations, Stacy, and on to you. Thank you, Rashmi, and thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. I am so excited to share our Arlington High School Library online with you with a quick walkthrough of our website. Um, so I'm going to start with some of the design principles that we use to make the new site more accessible, more user-friendly, and more visually appealing. First, we really wanted to streamline access to the site, and thanks to our friends in IT, a new memorable URL provides quick and simplified entry. We also chose a color palette to use throughout the site, inspired by our school colors. And we use student-centered language throughout. For example, instead of search the catalog, we say find books. Visual icons provide a clean, modern look um, and make it easy to give directions. So we can say, click on the picture of the target. We also have library news and quick links to our most commonly used outside resources on the Streamline homepage. And finally, the new Google Sites is mobile device friendly. And we are working on adding alt text to images to make it more accessible for screen readers. Of course, the pandemic has absolutely driven home the need for an online presence. I like to tell students the library is open 24 hours a day on the web. So turning to some of the content on the site, users can search the catalog for books, um, but they can also search visually by genre. And if they need more help deciding what to read, we have an online community of student and staff book reviews called AHS Reads Together. Um, as well as an online form where they can answer a series of questions and we write back with at least three book recommendations from our collection. The website is also the launch pad for Sora, our online ebook and audiobook collection. Um, and then for research and instruction, we provide pages for specific class assignments, lists of database, as well as general subject guides. So a user can come in looking for help researching current events working on their math fair project, finding our culinary arts digital collection, and so on. The AHS Research Handbook was rewritten as a dynamic website in 2015 with representation from math, science, English, history, and special education departments. Um, and this year it was substantially updated as a companion website. Each step of the research process has guiding questions, technology tool tips, and deeper instruction. This is a form for article requests through interlibrary loan. I like to tell students, if we don't have it, we can probably get it for you. Besides students, our other audience is, of course, teachers. And we wanted to showcase what's possible with some exemplars of library collaboration. Um, this is also their one-stop shop to book classes, request technology loans, use our streaming video platform, and so on. And then it was really important to us that the website helps students engage with the library program whether they're physically in our space or not, and to provide some sense of continuity as the physical space is, is in flux in these years. So students can sign up to come to the library directly from the website on their own devices. They can share book reviews, suggest books, learn about our student clubs like the Student Library Advisory Committee and the Intergenerational Book Club. You can visit the Historic Yearbook Collection, which was the collaboration of AHS students and Robbins Library through a Massachusetts digitization grant. Um, and you can actually click through this picture and, and most other images in this slideshow to learn more and, and visit the yearbooks. And then our new library news page provides a running feed of book displays, activities, events, instructional tidbits, and more. 
So thank you so much for the opportunity to share our AHS library online with you. Um, and then we're gonna shift gears and, and turn to some of the department's highlights for the year. And I will start with our top three for Arlington High School, um, which are our website, as you've seen, um, our big move and the chance really to like reconnect in person. Um, so we moved from the, the, um, the, the old library, which is being, being taken to bits as we speak, um, to a temporary location in the space known as Old Hall in December. Um, and that required significant weeding and reorganization and has come together really nicely into a functional and pleasant space that students really do enjoy. And we're back in person with classes, clubs, lots of opportunities for collaboration with student groups. Um, we're launching Wellness Wednesday activities to promote social emotional learning through an AEF grant. And we have a great core of student volunteers. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to my KA librarian colleagues who will share with us more about our elementary, middle, and district-wide activities. The professional library staff have been active in collaborations with many district stakeholder groups, including students, district staff, building staff, and more. Uh, the professional library staff collaborates and co-teaches on research, introduces our databases, and works on projects like Reading Without Walls and the Rainbow of Us projects at Dallin, which leverage books to have meaningful conversations about identity and culture. Here, Liz engages Dallin second graders in a rich conversation about identity, race, and Black History Month. Liz and Jennifer met in, in the fall with middle school history teachers to present a self-paced library research training, including our new databases and many other tools and services available from library staff. Stacy, I think the slide is behind. Thank you. Uh, the entire library team of our paraprofessionals and our professional staff promotes a culture of reading, learning, and positive identity development. The PTOs and paraprofessionals have been, again, able to hold in-person book fairs this year, much to the delight of families and students. Next. We regularly share information with and book suggestions with district staff about social events and about current events and socially relevant topics. These slideshows often include cultural observations, heritage months, and history months. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm Liz Fipsuero, one of the K-8 librarians. Thank you, Jennifer and Stacy. Um, so our paraprofessionals and PTOs arranged author visits at many of the schools this year. And these author visits engage students and ignite enthusiasm for reading and writing um, that carries over into their classrooms. The investment uh, and effort put into updating library collections and making online content collections available is really paying off. So students and teachers are excited to use our many databases and tools. And every month, uh, Arlington Public School users access almost 10,000 items online, while print circulation has risen by 59% since school year 19, the year before the district began reinvesting in its K-8 libraries. Our libraries are exciting spaces, uh, supporting the research, reading, and curiosity of students and staff. The paraprofessionals promote new books, encourage student knowledge and awareness through read-alouds, circulate and shelve books, create exciting displays, and share interactive activities for students. And with the addition of Renee and one new hire in the fall, we will have one certified librarian for every two or three elementary and middle schools. Library staff will be able to focus on individual school needs and continue to build relationships with teachers, students, and of course the school community. And so on behalf of the entire library team, Thank you for inviting us to join you tonight. And we really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you as well as your continued support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Hayter? When I came on board uh, school committee 11 years ago, 
we had no certified librarians in the district. We quickly got one at the high school. And the new librarians and paraprofessionals are probably just recently. I want to thank you all for doing a phenomenal job. Thank you. Anybody? Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you very much for this presentation. It's been great. Um, I had one question, which is, I just wonder what the e-books are being read on. Is it on the students' phones? Do we have electronic readers? Do we need electronic readers? Um, I just uh, want to wonder about access for all students. Thank you. For any access on uh, and really any device, the majority of <laughs> elementary students are accessing it on school devices, both the iPads in K2 and the Chromebooks in grades three through five. And as you mentioned, equity is a concern, which is why we make those devices available to students over breaks and the summer so that it does not create a digital divide situation. As students get older, they tend to do more accessing through personal devices, but they, all, they still have access to a school Chromebook, which can, util, which can access any of the materials on Sora. Great, thank you very much. Mr. Schleckman? Yeah, if I may uh, also congratulate you on this excellent performance. I mean, uh, Mr. Hayner came onto the committee after we made the cuts in 2004. I think historically you have to know that uh, in 2004, Governor Romney cut state aid to local districts by 20%. And we had a failed override that year, resulting in a, a, a slew of cuts. And one of the things we made was just absolutely heartbreaking was to lose our elementary librarians, totally gone because of budget considerations. I'm glad we're back and uh, you're, you're like a phoenix rising out of the ashes to build a really beautiful program and, and I hope that we have the support of the community so we can keep on keeping on. Thank you. Dr. Um, I just want to say thank you to the library team. This is one of the most dynamic and exciting teams that I have the pleasure of working with every day. And um, as a former leader of libraries in one of my former roles, I just have so much immense respect for and have learned so much about what librarians do, having never been one, but being a frequenter of them from the time I was very young. Um, this group really moves mountains in the name of making sure that excellent books are in the hands of every child. So thank you all for everything you do and for the wonderful presentation. We're very lucky to have this team and very glad that it's growing. Sure. I would like to thank the team for a wonderful and dynamic presentation and uh, the amount of information that you have provided to our teachers have been invaluable and uh, especially as, as we have these very um, exciting DEI goals and one of our goals is to make sure that we want our students to see themselves in the materials and be able to have a window to the world and so they can understand what their place is in the general society. So thank you for all that you do and uh, once again you just make me very proud. Uh, Mr. Thielman or Ms. Morgan, I, Ms. Morgan you can call out if you can, if you have anything. I saw a hand on the Zoom screen. Did somebody want to respond? No? Okay. Um, I'll just echo um, the thanks and appreciation that my colleagues have given. Um, about this time last year, you gave a presentation um, about elementary mm. school libraries and diversifying the books. And I, you know, I'm thrilled that we've been able to add more um, elementary librarians since that time. Um, and I am excited to see this program continue to grow. So thank you all very much. Okay, next on our agenda um, is the uh, heterogeneous grouping initiative proposal and possible vote. Uh, so um, Dr. Holman is going to say some words and I know there are some other people here to speak to that just so the committee knows my um, Plan because this is the first time that this proposal has been presented at a full school committee meeting. Um, we'll do a round with questions and then a second round if there are comments that people would like to make um, after Dr. Holman and her team make their presentation. Yeah. All right, Dr. Okay. Holman. 
Uh, Ms. Diggins, I'm going to send over to you the uh, USB for the clicker okay. so that you can plug it into the presentation. I can just pass it down. Um, and while Ms. Diggins pulls up the slides so that I can present them, I have a few words I'd like to say, and then I'll start the presentation and then hand it off to Dr. Janger. So since the fall of 2020, before I began in my role as superintendent of schools, I have been following conversations about leveling and heterogeneous grouping in Arlington, specifically at Arlington High School. Like many neighboring communities, including several districts in the Middlesex League, APS teachers, staff, families, and students have been thinking about the equity implications of our current leveling and tracking practices. I said in my interview with the school committee in November of 2020, and I believe today that any conversations about leveling practices should be community conversations. I have endeavored to work with administrators, teachers, families, and students to ensure that such conversations would both occur and inform our efforts to move this work forward. I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging that conversations and decisions linked to disrupting structural inequity are never easy. They are always fraught with questions about the allocation of our most precious resources when it comes to our children, time, money, and opportunity. As we enter into another discussion on this topic, I want to highlight a few things that I believe provide important context to conversations about how we place students in classes with their peers. First, instructional equity is not a zero-sum game. By this I mean well-designed instruction does not give to one student at the expense of another. We have students in our schools who have internalized explicit and implicit messages about their academic ability that some achieve and some simply can't. These are problems of the system and provide us with a reason to address and repair that system. Students who require support, time, or a different approach vector to learning should not be penalized for their learning needs by being segregated from their peers. To do so disservices them and it disservices their peers. Second, access to rigorous and challenging material increases student engagement. I challenge the notion that there are unmotivated students who will slow the pace or diminish the level of rigor in the classroom. Instead, the opposite is true. Students who otherwise did not have access to their peers and assignments in honors level classes will rise to the occasion and actively contribute to a strong classroom atmosphere. This is an investment in giving all students the opportunity to explore and experience high expectations. I would ask our community members to consider times when you've been most motivated to learn something new. For me, this rarely happens when the task at hand is easy. We are most motivated when we are challenged, and humans are programmed to be lifelong social learners. We are also most challenged when we're surrounded by people who understand and address problems differently from ourselves, and when there's no one right answer and no single way to address a problem or an issue. All students deserve an opportunity to access instruction that meets these criteria. Finally, equity work is best done when individuals and organizations move together towards a common goal. I have experienced this in my own work and I know it to be true. My first district improvement goal for this school year, approved by the school committee this fall, was to build a collaborative and equity focused leadership culture. The proposal before you tonight allocates one of our most precious resources, time, for AHS teachers to do exactly that. Our teachers know that all of their students are capable of high level thinking. They want to pursue unlevel classes that hold all students accountable and to high expectations. They are engaged and motivated by the challenge of building supportive universally designed classrooms. What we have in this proposal is an opportunity to eliminate a structure that exacerbates inequity in order to introduce a new structure that has the potential to significantly improve practice, instruction, and collaboration for ninth grade students and teachers at Arlington High School. In my entry plan report, I wrote that collegiality and mutual respect are necessary preconditions for challenging conversations about equity and access. This proposal is an example of our teachers' eagerness to have those conversations. The proposal before you tonight is the result of over a year of thoughtful conversation and feedback from Arlington families, teachers, and students. We acknowledge that the experiences some families and students have had with heterogeneous grouping at Arlington High School in the past were not positive ones. This proposal is not the same as the proposal presented in the spring of 2021 in several ways. First, this proposal is designed to address concerns raised about previous heterogeneous grouping experiences by members of the Arlington community, many of whom we have heard. This proposal was de developed in conversation with students, families, and teachers. 
This proposal introduces structural supports for teachers, including lower class sizes and time for collaboration and common planning. This proposal is intentionally very limited in its scope, giving us a small and protected space to iterate on and improve new practices. And this proposal is rigor rigorous in its articulation of data sources, qualitative and quantitative, that we can collect and triangulate in order to assess the success of the initiative. And finally, this proposal is supported by many members of our community, including several parents, AHS English teachers, and teachers in other departments, the Arlington Human Rights Commission, and the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. We do not claim to have done this work perfectly, and we do not assume that our plan will be successful without focused and sustained effort, attention, and accountability. We have learned a lot about families and students' concerns throughout this process, and we're committing, committed to continuing to learn as we move forward. I'm looking forward to tonight's discussion, and we will go ahead and get started with the presentation. Ms. Diggins, have you shared slides? Share, please. Uh, is it shared for the folks on Zoom? Because it doesn't, it's not shared for the folks on Zoom. They're saying they can't. Jeff, Mr. You can't Spielman, you can't see, see it, can you? Sorry. So we need to share it on that computer. No, 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 share the slides. There we go. There you go. Can you hit the present button, please? Nope. It says slideshow on the... Uh, mm -hmm. Jeff didn't know he should have come to you. He can't get to it. It's that one. Yellow, no, re yellow oh. rectangle underneath. Slideshow, sorry, not. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Fielman, you can see it now. Yes. Good. Okay. All right. So, tonight's presentation, I'm going to open with a little bit of district context quickly, and then I will turn it over to Dr. Jenger. So, I have um, shared this slide with the CIAA subcommittee um, as well, and I want to emphasize that we realize, and I just stated, that this is a systemic challenge. It's something that we need to address at multiple levels of the system, um, and something that we are committed to addressing at multiple levels of the system. So, what this slide is showing, um, and I, I believe it's fine, uh, Ms. Diggins, we're okay. Uh, what this slide is showing is that from grade three to grade eight, and there are, yeah, it's fine. Um, from grade three to grade eight, we have achievement gaps. Um, these gaps are lagging indicators. They're not leading. In other words, this is what happens when we have opportunity gaps in the system or areas where students struggle to access um, instruction that is rigorous in order to show that they are meeting grade level standards. So this begins at grade three. We recognize that. It moves through our system. Importantly, we begin the uh, practice of structured leveling uh, as early as grade six, and we begin to see outcomes decrease for all student groups uh, at middle school. And so that's not necessarily a causative statement, like structural leveling uh, is the reason why we begin to see these trends shift, but it is a reason for us to pay very close attention uh, to what happens at the secondary level, to increasing rigor at the secondary level, to thinking about what barriers to access might exist at the secondary level. But importantly, this starts even younger than that. Um, as we've heard in public comment, we also need to look at our inclusive structures at the elementary level and make sure that we're not pulling students out of core instructional time um, in ways that reduces their access to some of the same opportunities that will impact them later on. So we are doing this at the district level. We can talk about those initiatives at later dates. We don't need to dwell on them now, uh, but a few of them are listed on this slide and in the materials that you have for today. 
And I would like to hand it over to Dr. Jenger. And Dr. Jenger, I can drive the slides. Just tell me when you want me to move forward. So we've gone over a lot of this. Is this on? Mm -hmm. We've gone over a lot of this material before. So uh, the piece of me was not entirely sure of which things to discuss as we went through this because we've presented this a number of times to the community. But just to back up for a second, I think it's important to remember as we go into this where how we started this process. And we didn't start this process just this spring or just, just last spring or just this fall. The process of moving towards inclusion, the process of thinking about how our curriculum offered equal high level opportunities to all of our students began for me at least nine years ago because that's how long I've been here. But I really began even before then. So we have been going through the process of eliminating, eliminating levels within the system. So right now we have only AP, honors, advanced, which is college preparatory, and then curriculum B. We built co-tots over the last six years so that general education curriculum B classes were eliminated so that all students in general education classes, um, even if they were on IEPs, were participating in the regular classes with their classmates and go and working towards a college preparatory curriculum. So that model is something that we've been moving on going forward. This conversation was really launched in some ways by an opportunity, which was that oh, as our teachers have been reviewing and aligning their curriculum to make sure that the college preparatory classes, that's curriculum A, and the honors classes, that's curriculum H, were having the same standards, the same experiences, the same high level curriculum, they more and more began to feel that it was going to be much more effective and possible and appropriate for those students to all be taught together. And that was a feeling across English, history, science, as well as our math department, although the process is more complicated in many of those departments. So that began this conversation. So this fall we um, pulled together after a, um, a presentation to the Curriculum Instruction Accountability and Assessment Committee, a representative committee of parents, students, teachers, um, administrators and community members to do a deep dive into our data, the research, the practices, um, and to think about what it was we could do to try to address the issue. And I'll talk in the next slide about what the problems that we were trying to address were. Um, but we went through that process of developing that. Our goal was to have a consensus decision, so the group met until we were able to agree on the proposal. And remember, a consensus decision doesn't necessarily mean that everybody gets what they want, but that everybody agrees that they're going to put that presentation together, that they can live with what is there. Um, and the reasons why this started was because we have ample evidence that students in our schools have different experiences. They have different opportunities offered to them. They have different expectations offered to them. Um, they have different um, messages given to them about their potential. And we see that that iterates over time, so it leads to gaps that have widened by the time they get to high school. But at the same time in Arlington, the overall level of capacity of all of our students arriving in high school is still very high. And all of our students, what we see, is are perfectly capable of doing high-level co college preparatory curriculum with adequate support. Um, and so when you look at those disproportionate participation rates, in, uh, what, where do we see that in levels? We see that in disproportionate rates in terms of honors level work, um, by IEP, by race, IEP status, ELL status, socioeconomic status. We see inconsistent classroom experiences. When we survey students, when we interview students, we find that our students of color, our, our low SES students, our ELL students, our students with IEPs, experience differences in terms of rigorous expectations from their teachers, their impression of that, in terms of their relationships with teachers, in terms of their sense of belonging in the school. And so those things align, the levels that we're seeing, as well as the experiences of those students. Um, so what can we do? How does this address that? So most importantly, before I even go into sort of the technical aspects, is, is the simple point, which is that we have highly expert teachers who get very good outcomes, right? And the teachers believe that this is in the best interest of all students. 
they would not do this if they didn't think they could do it and they would not do this if they didn't think it would be better for students and they're asking for the opportunity to try we are not asking to um, th there's many conversations and we get excited about the enormous potential for structurally revising this the school and if we build expertise we will work towards that um, but what we are talking about right now is giving eighth grade students the opportunity to come to high school and experience honors level classes to make a choice about whether or not they want to experience honors level what they want to do the honors level work and to be with their classmates in at least one content area and we expect that to have a wide range of positive impacts not just on those students but on all students we see in Arlington an epidemic of student stress and anxiety part of that becomes from the values that we inculcate in them we want students to have high levels of achievement but we don't want their levels of achievement to be about who we think they are we don't want to be telling students you're an honor student or you're an A student we want to be telling them that you're a student who we care about who's today doing honors level work or A level work and we value that equally in both and by separating them we give a message that that's not the case so what are we looking to do in the current model this gives access to higher level tasks for ninth grade English students for everybody it also gives access to a more diverse classroom for everybody and we believe we say this all the time that the diversity of our community is its strength so it's important that we give students the opportunity to experience that full diversity of experiences we know that putting students in a more inclusive environments builds motivation and engagement for all students there's ample evidence of that in addition we're bringing more resources to the table so dedicated additional common planning time and I'm going to explain it here there'll be a slide later that talks about it so one of the questions was how does co-teaching work I mean how does common planning time work so the plan is to give the teachers in each of the teams you all know what the teams are a common planning time so one of their periods they will be their prep period now that's not giving them additional time right they would have four periods during the course of the week when they're both when they're all free for their prep time but teachers by contract get five preps a week we're going to give them an additional prep to make sure that that can be designated to doing work on this um, to be honest we think that the teachers will make good use of the time whether we ask them to or not but I know they'll certainly value and make good use of the additional time um, we're planning on having small class sizes um, capping the average class size at 20 there will be some variance but also by grouping them in these pods of three and pre scheduling that it will smooth out the enrollment across all of those classes and one of the things that we've talked about that has actually also enabled this is sort of a later conversation is because you're going to have these six teaching teams it suddenly becomes possible to do something we've wanted to do for years which is to run um, community building and equity training with all of the freshman classes because we can do that in six waves of, of retreat days we have a model for DEI training that we've done with ideas as well as voices united um, and we really feel like that's going to help those groups of three to four classes build a sense of spirit and build the norms and culture that will help them take advantage of and really benefit from the more diverse classroom so the plan we've talked about before so English 9 ELA will be heterogeneously grouped by that we mean homogeneously grouped which is that we will put everybody together in the same classes we will distribute them across the 18 to 19 sections students will then within the class make their choice about whether they are going to do honors level work or advanced level work in the classroom they'll have a decision point around three to four weeks in the first semester and then they'll be able to change their decision in the second semester if they want to do that all students to be clear though will have access to that work and to those expectations throughout the entire year so their transcripts and their GPA weight will reflect the chosen level um, and what that means is that actually what will go on the transcript next year will look exactly the same as what goes on the transcript this year so we'll say you took honors level freshman English or a level freshman English um, so again as we've explained three sections or four for each of those six periods four of those teams as we've explained will include a co-taught section 
and we are going to have there's conversations in our planning about how we can take advantage of the team model to be more flexible within our co-teaching model. But the basic idea is that there will be a, a special educator assigned to one of those groups of classes and specifically to one of those sections for our co-taughts. Right now we have three sections of co-taught in ninth grade. We're adding an additional one which will actually help us to spread the students out and give them more opportunity. Um, the common planning time I've already explained. And, and this is the most important in terms of the conversation. And we have a, a, one of our English teachers here to talk about that later. That what we want to make sure is that honors level work is about the students doing higher level work. So the difference would be in terms of the level of complexity of their writing assignments, the level of complexity of the tasks that they're doing. And how, student, how teachers differentiate that is something we're pretty good at already. And Ms. Basso will explain this in a little bit. Next slide. I think this is Deb. Mm -hmm. I think she's online. Ms. Perry, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. OK, thank you. Um, getting together to talk about the work that we do is um, part of the regular routine that occurs in the English department. Um, we have put now into our practice for the purposes of this HGI proposal um, a few times that it will be dedicated specifically, not just, not just to look at the work that we've done through the eyes that we usually have, but through the eyes of how we might want to adapt or change the work that we do in order to be as effective as we can in heterogeneous classes. Um, so we have two different, um, two different circumstances where this is going to happen. The first, is a day in May. Um, it'll be a full day where all teachers who will be teaching ninth grade will meet. We'll spend the first half of the day reviewing what we did this year. We've added, we added a new title. We wanna talk with each other about how that went. Um, wanna look at areas that will need to be changed, modified, um, things that went well. Um, trading information that we um, gained individually around the work that we've done. Um, the second half of the day will be spent thinking about what we need to do in the summer to plan in order to make this new project as, um, as productive, as effective as possible. Um, so we will be thinking about the common assessments that we have. We'll be thinking about the titles that we've been using. We'll be thinking about the, the support materials that we use um, to help kids look further and deeper into various topics that we discover. So in May, <clears throat> we will do a sort of a personal and a group review of how the year went and things that we might wanna think about changing and then developing an agenda for the summer. In the summer, we're gonna meet for a week um, and we've listed here some of the things that, that we'll probably be doing. Um, we can refine the scope of the curriculum, which simply means taking a look at what we're asking for. What are the rubrics? What are the activities? What are our assessments and expectations? Um, the idea of setting expectations is going to take some thinking and take some time. We have really high expectations now, and I expect we'll be adding to those and modifying them in various ways. Um, reviewing and implementing concepts of differentiation, um, these are things that we all do um, and we may want to make more specific. We want to incorporate them into the lessons that, we're, that we are um, writing and um, the use of shared formative assessments. We already have a lot of assessments that we do in common around the various books that we teach. We have a common final exam. We'll look at those things to see if we need to add to them, if we need to change them and how we might best think about assessment, which I think is going to be one of our, um, one of our best set of discussions around how this will work in terms of the assessments that we have and the assessments that we wanna construct and the assessments that will be, make the most sense for the work that we'll be doing. Um, I think the last item on the slide is something that we've talked about with the school committee before, but I think it's really important because it sometimes doesn't get talked about. And that is the idea of explicitly teaching cooperative and independent learning skills to diverse groups of students. And 
those are things that we know how to do and that we will build into the work that we do in our English curriculum. I'd like to introduce Liza Basso next, who is gonna talk um, for a minute about one lesson that she's constructed that um, builds in um, some uh, diversity in terms of the expectations for students. I, we had a slide, but I don't see it here. I think. I'm not sure where it is. Hold on. <laughs> Maybe I, I did not make it into your presentation. I didn't make it into the. Well, it's here on my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Do you want me to share, send it to? I lost the slide, Liza. Better living through technology. Yes, but didn't make it into this one. I just shared a version of this with you. Liza, why don't you go ahead and start talking and we'll find it. Great. Good evening. Thank you all very much for giving me the opportunity to share my work with you. Um, I'm an English teacher at the high school. This year I teach two sections of A-level ninth grade English. Um, in the past, I've taught honors level as well as the heterogeneous version last year. Um, so tonight I wanted to just share one assignment that I created that incorporates differentiation. Um, and it comes at the end of a unit that is centered around the idea of decision making. So over the course of the unit, we talk about decision making in our own lives, the factors that influence our decisions. And we read a number of texts that circle around similar themes. Um, the core text is Romeo and Juliet. So the final assignment that I shared um, was an essay assignment where students need to pick out one decision made by a character in Romeo and Juliet and kind of think about how it speaks to a larger purpose or message on the part of Shakespeare and the play. Um, so all students have this task, have this same prompt, but there is an additional honors component which challenges students to synthesize a second text that we read during the course of the unit um, to kind of talk about how these two texts communicate with one another, whether it's adding to the argument made by Shakespeare or challenging it. Um, so this offers students the opportunity to there we are. Okay, so you can see the component and the prompt here. Um, so yeah, it gives students the opportunity to practice this higher level thinking skill of synthesis by bringing in another text that we read um, during the course of the school year. So in addition to this prompt and the differentiation built within it, I also include a graphic organizer for all students along with this prompt that breaks down each part of the writing process which makes the task accessible to all different levels um, of learners. We also have several days of in-class workshopping, peer editing, as well as one-on-one -on -one conferences with me so that I can meet with individual students where they are, talk through their essays and what they think that they need to work on. Um, so those are the main things that I wanted to share. You can take a look at the prompt and the honors component. Um, and yeah, unless there are questions, I'll pass it back to Dr. Janger. Thank you all very much. So actually, this is something that kind of gets me excited as, and sort of full disclosure, when I taught English in high school, I taught ninth grade heterogeneously grouped English. That is not why we are doing this. That is not where this came from. Um, but it was, in fact, my favorite teach class to teach. Um, and one of the things that would really excites me about this is that there were years when I did this as part of a teaching team. And so part of where this teaching team idea came from was two sets of concerns. One was this question about how do we differentiate for the students and how do we give the students, flex the teachers, flexibility to support students. So building these teaching teams of three to four sections gives the teachers opportunities to collaborate and to do regrouping and to think about how they're able to support the students in different ways. Um, and then second, um, it addresses a lot of the questions that folks had about the consistency of experiences across the classes because the teachers working together on common activities and common, um, common standards um, assists them with more aligning their practices and what's going on in the class. So right now, let's be clear, our teachers have done a lot of work on aligning the curriculum. They have shared digital resources, they have assignments, they have shared rubrics, they have shared content within this class that they use on both, at both levels 
and they use across their classes. They have monthly department and PLC meetings where they work to coordinate that. And if they're lucky, they have sporadic opportunities to meet with each other during their prep times, during an X block, or at other times they may carve out of their day. What's different here is that by making it so that we have three or four sections and potentially a special educator and a common prep time, they now have protected additional collaborative time with colleagues to work on those shared digital resources, to align the times when they use them, to think about how they're going to use them in common. They have the ability potentially to regroup or to reorganize. The example of these community building activities allows us to meet together with three classes at the same time to build a community within those classes. And there are times when a teacher may want to pull out a smaller group of students to work on something and have some other group work on a larger set of things. It gives you, and this the last piece I think is one of the most important, it gives them the ability to develop shared understandings, to use those assessments in common, to grade them, to look at them together. The English teachers do that, but they do that maybe once or twice a year now when they can carve out a period in order to do it. Um, they can look at their grading policies, they can look at the common sequence. One of the things we've talked about is that if you look across the set of core texts in the English department, there's a need to shuffle because we don't have enough books necessarily. So they go through a sequence of skills in the same order, but not necessarily a sequence of texts. One of the things that we will plan as part of the planning process is to take some of those core texts and to work on those in the same order at the same time, which does mean we'll have to buy some more books. Because um, you'll need, if you're going to have 360 kids doing Persepolis all at the same time, we probably only have 100 copies right now, and we'll need to buy enough so that that can be a common activity. And that's incredibly powerful. It's incredibly powerful in terms of teachers talking about it, kids talking about it, and then being able to do common work and common assignments. Deb, did you want to take this one? It says Deb or Matt under it. <laughs> yes, I would. Um, as they can. Um, so I think the opportunity to be able to, to discuss what's going on coming out of the summer meeting where the planning will have happened, the overall planning will have happened, then to be able to sit down purposefully to talk about if the things we've planned are working and if they're not, then how can we change them? The opportunity to do what Matthew said a minute ago um, around um, having organized time to, to share papers and look at those and, and talk about grading and how it's working and what are the things we're looking for. Those are, those are really, really um, time consuming and important um, procedures, which this common planning time is going to help us do. Um, so when um, this slide talks about structure, the specific blocks will be designed um, for common planning and then they'll have access to their colleagues during regular planning periods as well as for additional meetings. Um, it's important to know that there's an absolute time and that will augment the sort of um, opportunities at lunch and the opportunities after school and the other times when, when people tend to get together and want to talk about things. But knowing that there's an actual time you can sit down and say, hey, what happened with this in your class? What, what are you learning? What do you know? What were the problems? What are the successes? Did you do it a different way? Those are the kinds of questions that are constant um, in a teacher's mind. And often you only have your own mind to give the answer. Um, so being able, knowing, being able to know that you'll be able to talk with someone else about something that you've planned together is, is um, invaluable. Um, the list here of things that, that might happen um, one of the things that we never get to do is peer observation because there's never everyone's teaching at the same time. So having freer blocks um, or free blocks when other people might be teaching is a terrific opportunity for people to sort of say, to learn how someone else is interpreting a potential lesson or trying it out or seeing what kids are doing or possibly even helping out a teacher who wants another person in the room um, for whatever, whatever the process or the lesson might be. Um, collaborative grading I've mentioned, and then refining and further developing targeted fo focus areas for the for each quarter. Um, 
that's that goes on now. We have always taken time to do it um, and to know that we have more more time that's that's being acknowledged for us, I think will be um, well received and very valuable. Um, I think we've said it all. I think Matthew said much of it. Okay, so these last couple are uh, me. Um, I wanna sort of share what our plan is for um, reporting back to the community on how things are going. We would do updates to the school committee and include an, a full update to the community in October, January, and May. We would slate um, presentations to the school committee at that time and also develop reports that we would send out to the full community on how the initiative is going. Uh, we would have teachers report on in those presentations uh, what their experiences have been in the classroom, some of the things they're learning, what they're um, doing in common planning time, and um, how some of that is going from their perspectives. We would report as an administration on um, the available data that we have, like survey results, student grades, um, results from common planning, as, uh, common assessments, student participation, and honors, uh, parent and student feedback. We would plan on getting uh, feedback both from the parents and from the students as part of our progress reporting. In, in order to assess the pilot's success, uh, we would look at data indicators from the original proposal that we listed um, and also ongoing formative assessments in various areas that are specific to content in ninth grade English. Um, and a lot of folks have asked, you know, what are the indicators of success with regards to the numbers that you're looking at? Um, we are looking at um, and for closing achievement gaps uh, for the subgroups that I've talked about and that we've talked about. Our students who have IEPs, um, our students who come from um, homes that may not have as much advantage, our students who are English learners. We are looking for gaps to close. We are looking for a closing experiential gaps on surveys. We have significant evidence that tells us that some of our students experience school very differently, as Dr. Jenger said, from other students. We want to see those gaps closing. Um, and we're looking for improving outcomes for all groups of students, all students. We wanna see all of those lines go up. Um, this is not about improving outcomes only for some groups of kids. This is about improving outcomes for all groups of students. And so those things need to happen in order for anything to move forward. We have also extended our timeline for potential expansion of this pilot. We've been asked on both sides of things, you know, what what is your vision for this? Where is this going? And we don't have an answer to that question yet. We have ideas. We have had other versions of this proposal that are larger. Um, we have ways we can think about expanding this out through ninth grade to for a supportive experience into the high school before you choose a pathway through the high school and maybe into more level classes. Um, or we have ideas that take this up through English where you might have uh, AP for all or honors for all English in a particular content area. We don't know what the next steps in this will be. We need to take the time to do the work and assess it. So we would want to assess the impact of the pilot over a couple of years. Um, we would limit adjustments to the model to ninth grade ELA for the following year, which gives us some time to adjust our approach um, in a subsequent year to analyze additional data, um, to address in any inconsistent messaging about honors level courses as students enter AHS. We've heard that the um, messaging around honors courses at eighth grade varies and that that comes from lots of different sources. And so we know we need to address that and that's something that we can look at doing for next year. I've learned a lot in watching that process go forward and that's a district level issue that I know that we need to think about. Um, and this would also give us time to uh, develop a more comprehensive vision for the future of leveling and pathways to college at Arlington High School and time to hear from the community on that. So uh, we've also provided you with some sample questions from the culture and climate survey that show what the classroom level survey can look like. Um, it's very focused on rigorous expectations and classroom experience in a particular class and our plan would be to do that survey this spring to give us a baseline um, in some ninth grade classes and then to do it again periodically throughout the year so that we could see if any of those indicators are improving from students experience this year into future years. Uh, and I believe that that is my last slide. So with that, we will take any questions and I know you have a couple of students with you students who may want to speak to it. They wanted to share as well. Mm -hmm. sure. You have to talk into the mic, yeah. Yeah, pass them up. Hi, my name is Lillian McLean and I'm a, a junior at AHS. I've come here today in support of the heterogeneous grouping proposal and the way I see it, heterogeneous classes have many benefits for all students. 
By giving students the opportunity to experience these heterogeneous classes, we allow them to understand what is expected of them before they make a decision on what level to take and give them a chance to understand um, the expectations, encouraging them to challenge themselves further. As a student of a APS, I have experienced the divide leveling has formed, where students begin equating their intelligence and capabilities with what classes they take. There are students that I had thought transferred because I hadn't seen them since middle school. By leveling classes and keeping them separate, we are creating a divide where students get don't get to know each other based solely on the classes they take. By placing A-level and H-level classes in the same room for, for everyone, um, we open up further discussion discussion between students regardless of what class they decide to take. Um, this promotes students um, challenging themselves further and by taking, by doing this we foster student relations across class levels. On top of that, leveling uh, further disadvantages already disadvantaged, disadvantaged students and I see this as the first step towards equity for all students and breaking down the divide that leveling, leveling creates. Throughout my discussions with students, teachers at our school, teachers at schools who have already implemented heterogeneous learning, and research we have looked into in the study group, I have decided that I believe the HGI pr proposal for uh, ninth grade English is the right thing for students, regardless of the level of class they want to take with benefits for all. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Hannah Markels. I'm a junior at AHS, and I'm also here to support the heterogeneous grouping initiative. Um, I've been working on the pre uh, the HGI initiative um, group, um, the group of parents, students, teachers, staff, um, uh, to discuss this initiative and see what if AHS wants to support it. And I'd say that our group has come to consensus that uh, that is a yes, and that's a group um, of people that many of them came into this process not supporting the initiative, and through research, um, their minds have been changed. Um, and when I first heard of this initiative, I wasn't sure if I supported it either. Um, because I just didn't have enough of the information. Um, and after going through that research myself, um, I believe the really powerful aspect of this, beyond the data, because I'm assuming you've all seen the data many times now, um, is the idea of uniting AHS. There's, as Lily said, there's kids I haven't seen since elementary school because of the different classes we've been put in, the clusters and OMS, and obviously there has to be some, we can't put every kid in the same room for every class, that'd be impossible. Um, but heterogeneous classes would really allow for this furtherness of the um, diversity, equity, inclusion that we talk about and that we put at the forefront of AHS's mission. Um, and so this is a pilot, this is a test, um, but I think if we really want to claim that um, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, is the forefront of APS as a whole, as well as Arlington High School, um, this initiative is uh, essential to that. So thank you for your time. Take any questions from the committee? Or um, I'm going to, I'm going to, can I move down? Uh, Mr. Hayner. No questions at this time. Mr. Cardin. Uh, I have a bunch, but I don't want to take up too much time, so. Stop me I'll if you stop want. You. <laughs> um, I guess uh, Miss Perry's been here, I think, the longest of anyone. C I, I don't know if she's, she's on. Can, did curriculum A and honors at, ever, at any point in your career here ever have different curriculum? We can stop sharing, yeah. uh, Ms. Yeah, yeah. Diggins. <laughs> can you hear? I don't know if you can hear me. We can hear you. Yes. Yes, it did. Um, when I first got here, there were five levels, um, and the, they were very distinctly different. Okay, so, so we've made a huge progress in the leveling to begin with, so just want to make that point. I think it's a surprise to a lot of people that the curriculum is the same in both honors and curriculum A, um, but st I'll try to stick to questions. Um, what are eighth grade teachers, like a new eighth grade teacher, what are they told about how to give recommendations? I don't know if you can answer that, Ms. Perry, for, for an ELA teacher. How are they mm -hmm. told to give recommendations in the, for, for eighth grade students? Um, let me start by saying that, um, as you know, parent, teachers make recommendations and parents um, choose often what they, what they talk with teachers, but they, uh, they have the option to choose what they want. Um, we usually talk about um, the, the capacity of a student to either write, write well, write in a, in a in a sort of reasonably strong way 
and work habits in general. Those are two of the major things that teachers talk about. Um, they used to talk a lot about, you know, uh, students getting ready for high school work, and we've sort of changed that that language. Um, and the, I guess what I can say to you is that the the numbers of students for each level have changed dramatically in the last five years. Um, I don't know if this is part of your question, but we it used to be that there were um, many more students in level A. Um, and, and fewer students in honors. And it came to an equal point a couple of years ago, and now it's the opposite. We have many more kids signing up for honors and fewer for level A. Um, and I think it, it, I'm not sure that the teachers are recommending that way. I'm pretty confident that they're not. I think that there's some um, movement on the part of parents to, to put kids in levels that way. Great, thank you. Um, so one question that a lot of parents have had uh, that that hasn't been answered is is if someone could give an example of how you how you would differentiate instruction. We've heard several times about how you differentiate the work assignments, the prompts. Again, tonight we had an, a, an, a very specific example of a prompt, but using that example, that prompt requires honor students to synthesize two different works. How do you teach those students? to synthesize two different works in a heterogeneous class. I'm not sure if uh, Liza is on. I don't want to put okay. you thoroughly on the spot, I, I can but respond. you may be the best to speak to that. Yeah, can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. um, so those other texts that they're pulling from in that final essay, we've all read them and analyzed them together th over the course of the unit. Um, so not in a formal writing way, but in a discussion-based analysis way, we've talked about how we can bring those ideas from Shakespeare and another author together. So we're practicing the skill of syn synthesis through discussion, through smaller writing assignments, um, so they're prepared to take that next step. So you're teaching everybody how to do synthesis, but you're only asking the honor students to do it on the assignment? Yes, in a formal, structured, written way, that would be more of a skill for an AP language and composition student. Okay. Can I jump in also that sure. any, anybody can, anybody could take advantage of that honors prompt. So one of the ways that tends to work is it's there. And so if a student wants to, wants to add that or include that in, in the piece of writing, you know, go for it. It's, so it's not exclusive. It's it's an it's there as an additive kind of thing. Great, thanks. Can I, can I ask a sure. Go ahead. So one of the things to realize about the structure of an English class, right, is that there are all kinds of different groupings and conduits in terms of activities. So students doing individual writing are individually conferencing with teachers, getting individual feedback. So while one teacher may be do, student may be doing something fairly concrete, another student on the same content may be doing something much more sophisticated with more transfer, more level of inspection. Then you've also got um, in independent reading activities, so students are doing different, some of the supplementary texts differently. You've got groups sometimes that are within level, sometimes cross level um, in terms of the understanding. So there's all these different ways in which students are accessing it. And then one of the things about, I mean even the current curriculum, but one of the things about the heterogeneous grouping is that all students are being exposed to the concepts, right? The idea of synthesis across texts. The difference is the level of sophistication and independence. So an honors level student is expected at this point to have learned to be able to do this independently, whereas the A level students may still be doing this in a coached or scaffolded model. So that's why one of them would do it on the exam, but the other one would have that as an option. Okay, um, now again on the class size, we're a little bit vague about the average. Is can we commit to a cap of 22, or something? Can there be a, a committed cap that we will not go over? By section size or by average size? By section size. I mean, I don't think we're going to have sections more than 22. So sure, I'm happy to commit to that. Great. I mean, what we will do is look across them. If we have an average, the plan is not to let the average get above 20. And so, if there's not an average, if there's an average of 20, the range will be between 18 and 22 naturally. And if something weird happens, we're going to fix it anyway. 
Okay, and then just back to the consensus of the HGI because there was a committee chat that one of the participants went to who indicated that she wasn't part of the consensus. She dissented or she wanted to dissent. So are, are you not aware that there was a dissenter or? So I saw that note in the yeah. chat. I don't know who that person was. I know that we had how many after the initial proposal came out, I think we had three or four subsequent meetings in which we discussed and discussed and discussed. Everyone in those meetings at the final meeting w was agreed that we had consensus. We then sent out the proposal to everyone on the committee and asked if anybody wanted to leave their name off and nobody told us that they wanted to leave their name off. Okay. Um, you know. Great. All right, thank you. Mr. Schlickman. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to focus on the teachers involved in the project. Uh, how many teachers do we have involved in the pilot next year? So we haven't finished scheduling, but Deb has actually Deb may have, have but it's seven or eight. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Deb. <laughs> I think it'll be eight, but I'm not finished scheduling, so it'll be around it'll be around eight roughly. Is that that's including the co-teaching uh, special ed people? Uh, it would, no, that'll be an added. additional two. Problem okay, yeah. that would be additional. So we'd have eight people who are normally teaching grade nine English as part of their load in the project. So my assumption yeah. is, is these folks who are in the project have all volunteered to do this and they want to be in this ninth grade uh, program. Deb, can you as, speak to that? I know um, you've been polling people multiple yeah, ways. Yeah, when, um, when scheduling happens, and I can't quite finish it because we don't exactly know where we're going with this, um, I sit down with teachers and say, "These are the, this is where, what I'm scheduling for. If there were someone who, I mean, everyone I've talked to, and I think I've talked to all, the, I'm not going to say it is everyone, but I'm fairly confident I've talked to all the potential ninth grade teachers, and they're all very excited about doing this, and they're willing and happy to do it. Um, and, and, I, and if there were someone who wasn't, I don't think I would schedule them for ninth grade English. And in, your, and in your professional opinion, they're capable of doing this and doing this well. I have, there's no doubt in my mind. So let, let me try to reframe this a little so that what we're looking to do in ninth grade is similar to what a literacy teacher on the elementary level is doing in terms of taking a heterogeneous group and grouping them like uh, based on assignments they're giving in their reading level at the time. I think more realistically, we're doing what we already do in 12th grade English classes. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we do it in other classes as, mm -hmm. as, I mean, we do it in ninth grade, we do it in 10th grade now, mm -hmm. because you, we have mixes, we, we mix students up in groups, mm -hmm. regardless of what the level is. There's mm -hmm. constant sort mm -hmm. of reassessment of what's going on. There are constant new questions. There's, there's, a, a, there's variability in all of, all of what we do. Um, and so this is not particularly a different kind of approach, even though it's being called something different. So essentially, instead of having two groups of kids, you, these honors kids and A-level kids, that we can differentiate, you've got a classroom of 20 and no more than 22 kids with 20 and no more than 22 different sets of skills, interests, and abilities. Yes, that's true. And, and you're I, meeting, I, and you're meeting the individual needs as best as you can for all of them. And that's what teachers do, kind of most of the time, anyway. Exactly. And in the context of teachers who are experiencing, uh, who are experienced in teaching honors, and can deliver an honors curriculum within this context. Yes. Okay. So we've got a bunch of teachers who want to do this, and a supportive administration. Uh, and so I think that this is something that uh, I, I can't see saying no to you. Uh, if it's the desire of these teachers to run this program, I think that's what we should be doing. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Just to clarify, this is questions, right? Not, uh, yes. Okay. So my questions have already been answered by both the revised proposal and as presented tonight. And Mr. Carden brought up one of my questions. So, thank you. Mr. Thielman. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I guess, so I have a couple of questions. We talked about um, the way we're gonna assess the pilot 
closing the academic achievement gap, closing the experiential gaps, improving outcomes. What are the benchmarks we have now for that? I would say the benchmarks we have now for that are our historical trends and data. We also have the benchmarks that come from the state when it comes to our targets for accountability. So they've published targets for Arlington High School in terms of uh, student growth percentile expectations, achievement expectations. Their expectation is our expectation for ourselves. We want to meet or exceed the standards that the state sets when they set a target for us. But those are that's just MCAS, right? So that's not yeah. really going to um, be available to us to assess this pilot for another two years, which is part of why we're extending the window for assessment. Because we wouldn't get the data until, so we wouldn't get really get any data on the on the pilot until two years from now. I wouldn't say that because I would say that if you're saying the state's targets that they set for us on accountability are one of the benchmarks that we would use, that would only be for MCAS, but we also have the benchmark of doing a survey now with our current students who are leveled into our structurally leveled um, high school, and we can compare that, that's a benchmark, against the survey data that we get next year. So we'll have the survey data and we'll have a benchmark for that. Um, if we do early assessments, that or if we do formative assessments throughout the year, we can monitor formative assessments and we'll, in the first one, we would get a benchmark um, for how things are going at the start of the year and then we could do additional assessments throughout the year and compare results. So we have other options and we also have historical data and trends that we're comparing our success to. So if we have a gap that's what it is now and it closes for students on IEPs, for example, if they achieve better as a result of having been in this um, pilot or if their experience gets better, um, then we can say that we've been successful in some ways. Um, Dr. Janger had his hand up too. No, I mean, I think, I mean, our primary measures of student progress are grades. So we have historical patterns of grades. We have historical participation rates in honors level um, classes. Um, we will have the baseline um, of the climate and culture surveys that we're going to do this spring and next year. Um, and then we will actually also have by next spring information about whether or not students continue to elect honors in future years in that class and in others. Um, then we will also have, I mean, then there's a number of, I think, formative assessments and common assessments that teachers will be doing throughout the year that will give us an indicator of where we are going. Um, and honestly, in many ways those are the most important, but also some of the hardest to sort of pull out mm -hmm. in an analytical way. Um, and then and then we will have the MCAS data. I would also add that we qualitatively, um, we've been in classrooms and we're going to go be in classrooms to get a sense of what's happening in Curriculum A honors um, and co-taught classes this spring. And we will be in classrooms during the school year next year too. So qualitatively that will give us a picture of how instruction is going, um, being in common planning time, observing common planning time and how that is going will give us a qualitative sense of how things are going, conversations with teachers will as well. So we'll co we can collect qualitative data through all those activities and use that to triangulate against all of the quantitative things we just named. Okay, thank you. The other question I have is several, uh, not several, a few students uh, that I know have uh, approached me, uh, or I've run into them in different places, and they've told me that they're in upper levels uh, heterogeneous classes, that they carry the burden of classroom discussions. And, uh, and they're honors level students, when they're in heterogeneous class, they carry the burden of classroom discussion. Now, I don't know if that's true uh, in every class, but how, how would you respond to honors students who say, that that's what they have to do when they're in a heterogeneous class. Ms. Perry, were you, you looked like you were going to respond. Sure. <laughs> well, um, I think Liza may have some comments on that too, but I taught heterogeneously um, for uh, many, many years, ninth grade particularly. Um, it was not, I mean, I, I guess I'm not a student and I wasn't then, but it was my impression that the discussions were fairly broad and fairly um, comprehensive in terms of people who could, who could and did communicate. Um, I, I do think, 
um, it, it can change, it can vary, I suppose. But one of the things that we mentioned earlier in, in the presentation was had to do with the idea of teaching students ways of listening, ways of um, contributing, ways of learning from and with each other. And, and it's, it's possible that um, in some classrooms, those rules are not laid out. And it's also possible that teachers, um, you know, are not necessarily always thinking along those lines. But we, we're, we're now making a concerted effort to construct classrooms where we are, we are, where we want everyone's voice to be heard and where we're going to, to have structures in place that I think help with that. Um, I, I can't argue with what the student said. I don't know and I don't know what subject, but um, I guess that's what I would have to say. Liza, is there anything in your experience that would add to that? No, I would just say that having effective discussions is a skill that requires scaffolding and practice. Um, so having all students practice in smaller groups um, and then coming to the larger scale, teaching students how to listen effectively and bring other voices into the conversation could be an ongoing goal. Um, and it's also about establishing community. So it does depend on the class, I think, too. Okay, thank you. Um, as a student, I'm also happy to speak on this. I've taken um, heterogeneous and honors in AP classes at AHS. Um, I took heterogeneous English last year and honors bio last year. Um, and one thing that I noticed was my honors bio class was dead silent when it came to participation. And it was one of the only actual um, homogeneous classes I was taking at the time because on Zoom we, um, le we changed the leveling in a lot of the classes. Um, and it was a semi awful experience to try to like it was it was very difficult to try to encourage discussions when especially in zoom breakout rooms which is already a hard um, place to be in but that honors class was very difficult my heterogeneous english class last year was incredibly active i didn't know who was taking honors or a level credit um, but i was really surprised over zoom um, that we were able to have these discussions and there was so much participation um, and also Regardless of, I know this, that's two examples and I'm one person, um, but as I've talked to many of my peers across the high school, there are a lot of factors that go into participation um, in a class, what time of day it is. I have an AP US history class that's uh, B block and it is also very silent. It's supposed to be one of the like, it's supposed, this is supposed to be a super group of, like, of high achieving students and everyone is asleep because it's 9 a.m. and we're high schoolers and we're tired. Um, <laughs> so I think that it's important to acknowledge the fact that it's not necessarily heterogeneous classes that tie into this discussion. Because um, I've heard this from people as well, but also I think it's a reminder like you're always gonna have students in a class that want to speak up more um, because they're excited about the material or they are just, um, more, in, like they're less afraid to speak up in front of their peers. Um, so I wouldn't say that that is a, um, a definitive measure to go against heterogeneous classes, because I think that's something that's apparent in all classes, regardless of level. My, my last question, if I may, is to what extent did the committee look at alternative research? In other words, research that, that was critical of heterogeneous groups. So for the most part, what we looked at was research that synthesized, because there are many, many studies, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies of different kinds of unleveled and heterogeneous grouping. When you look at the synthesis data in terms of the way research works, you would find a study that said, we tried a version of heterogeneous grouping or we tried a version of unleveled grouping, and it didn't work. But the way research works is what it doesn't say is, therefore, th it says it didn't work because it had these features. And when you look at the synthesis across, the vast majority of studies found positive impacts for students who would have been grouped in a lower level and, posit uh, and equal or positive impacts for students at the upper level. And then they talked about what are the features that make this unsuccessful. So it was unsuccessful when you had poor resource support, poor teacher support, poor teacher training, um, and a curriculum that was not designed and suited to be delivered heterogeneously, which is part of why we're organizing the program that way. So 
one of the questions people have said is, you know, did you look at the negative research? And the reality is you can find a study where it didn't go well, but in that study they tell you why. And that's what you learn from in terms of how we set this up. I'll just tell you one funny story. Can I tell this funny story? If you search for heterogeneous grouping, Arlington, Massachusetts, you will find a study from 1917 in which they piloted in Arlington a leveling practice. Different from this, actually they called it leveling, but actually they regrouped the students almost every month. So in the end, it was a version of what it is we're talking about now. This has been studied for an awfully long time, and apparently here. And finally, I guess the question for Matt is, do you think four, just four sections of, of co-taught classes is sufficient to support this? I do, but if it's not, we'll look at more, I think would be the answer. We looked at the numbers of students that need co-teaching, um, and normally we would have three, so we're adding a fourth in order to keep the number spread out. But we build the number of sections in the end based on the number of students who I've identified needs on their IEPs. Okay, thank you. Ms. Morgan? Um, I guess my question is, uh, we're still hearing a lot about honor students and non-honor students, which I think is kind of a shame given the intent of this, but um, given what the assignments look like, I'm curious how we can justify giving students who respond to a slightly different prompt a 0.25 boost on their GPA as compared to students who don't do that. Um, I, I don't, I don't, un I don't understand how we can do that. And I'm curious how people feel about that and, and why we think we can continue to do that. Uh, it's um, so first of all, in terms of grading practices, because that's what we're talking about, there currently are relatively parallel expectations at higher levels. One of the things that's going to happen over the course of the year is that over the course of the planning for this process is the teachers are going to look at the rubrics and programs and then grade together to say what does this rate against these two different scales and sets of expectations. So it's a little more complicated than just this one more piece of assignments. At the same time, to be perfectly honest, the next thing I would actually talk about in terms of some of our leveling practices mm -hmm. is grade weights. Um, grade weights are really problematic in that rather than defining a level of learning, they assign a mathematical value to it. Mm -hmm. They actually have generally been shown to discourage students from taking on higher level classes, taking on interesting classes, taking on a variety of different classes. And colleges don't really care about them because colleges have so many different sets of weighting practices that what they care about is a transparent transcript and that they then reweight their own grades based on their own practices. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the big thing is, you know, teachers grade for a living. Teachers' assessment of students' learning is what they do and the process of developing the rubrics, grading together, working together is going to help them to make it clear what the different sets of expectations are. I do think, Ms. Morgan, that the tension that you're raising is one that was discussed by the committee and considered, uh, particularly in thinking about different models. Um, and so th this is one of the future conversations that I think we would need to have as we assess the success or challenges of the pilot. Um, and to what Dr. Jenger said, would need to be part of any ongoing conversations about leveling practices at the high school. Yeah, I mean, it just, it seems like you guys had the opportunity here to sort of disrupt the status quo and, you, you know, you, you didn't, you, you didn't look at a lot of these other pieces that, that seem like they're really relevant and, um, well, and problematic. So we, I, you know, that's, that I, I'll save my feedback, I suppose, for later. But my question is, is still, how do you bring a program of studies back before the school committee next year, yeah. where you continue to weight ninth grade English separately for students who are receiving honors credit 
and for students who aren't. Thanks. Great. Um, so I just have two brief questions. Um, my first is we received a letter from um, a number of high school teachers uh, in support of uh, the, heter the heterogeneous grouping. And I guess I'm just curious how many of, what representation, and I, Liza, I don't know if you were part of that, but I'm just, you know, we hear the teachers are in support of this, the teachers are in support of this. We've received a letter from a number of teachers, um, but I'm wondering if you're feeling comfortable to say how many teachers that represents. Ms. Perry, can you speak to this? Because I know you looked into this for us. Yes, I did look into it. Um, there are three English teachers who did not sign the letter. Um, and I think they were for complicated reasons. I'm not sure it was about heterogeneous grouping. I think there were other issues around just putting their names on something, but I, I don't know. I wasn't involved in the letter. Uh, this is just the feedback that I've gathered. Um, so I, it's a fact, but that, that three out of, I guess, 18 or, or so people did not. Um, I don't see it necessarily as, a, as an issue, but it is a fact. Question is: um, You've talked a lot about the benefits of the of the co-teaching and the shared planning time. Would you also agree that having a special education teacher on that team, while they're going to be in a classroom with one of the teachers, is they essentially have all of the English teachers in that block? Is that if that's what we're calling it? Have access to that special education teacher. And so would you say that it's going to support and provide a resource to every teacher on that team, not just the special education teacher that's in that one specific classroom? I mean, so what I would say, one of the exciting things about co-teaching is, I know from my own experience, and I think teachers will tell you this, that when you really go and work with someone who's a specialist on <coughs> effectively differentiating for students who have different needs and are not neurotypical or don't learn in your typical pathways, that actually almost invariably improves your instruction for all. And so having a special educator doing that work as part of that team, um, whether they're working in one of the sections or not, the differentiation work they're doing is available and the participation in common planning time by that special educator I think is gonna really help inclusion for everybody. Um, because you know, there's a small proportion of students who have, have um, co-teaching on their IEP, but there's a much larger number of students in those classes who otherwise are receiving support services. And even, for the most part, students who are not on IEPs benefit from those different pathways for being able to figure out how things work. And if you May I also give you an example, please? Um, we introduced the book Persepolis this year um, for ninth grade. Um, the co-teachers, the English and the SPED co-teachers, asked for a day to create curriculum for that book, um, thinking that they might have to. It's a graphic novel. We hadn't taught it before. At this level, we weren't sure. So they worked together. Meanwhile, the, the other ninth grade English teachers separately had asked for a day as well. So what happened was, the co-teachers and the, um, the co-teachers together, four of them worked, um, and then they joined on another day, the ninth grade teachers in general. And so the work that they had done was highly um, you know, important and instructive to the rest of the teachers. So in a way, what you're asking about is something that we have actually incorporated into the kind of work that teachers have been doing. Um, and it's really, really helpful. And having more time will only make it um, a more regular practice. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna go around again um, with comments. So Mr. Hainer. I'd like to begin off by stating this, my opinion and my feelings. As a school committee person for 11 years, it's our job to hear the public's feelings. We are our job to articulate uh, what they have said to us. The past three or four months, daily, I would get emails and spend a certain amount of time dealing with heterogeneous uh, emails coming in. I would say 
some days it was 50-50, some days it was 40-60, depending on pro and con. The one thing I didn't get was I didn't get any con emails from students. I got a lot of positive emails from students. Some of my other uh, colleagues may have got them from students, but I got none. Uh, I am impressed with the two ladies that are here tonight. Uh, thank you. Um, I was, I'm sorry, three, oh. I apologize. <laughs> Heard from two. Um, my background is an elementary teacher, and I was taught in preparation to become an elementary teacher to teach to the student needs, not make the student meet my needs or my lessons. <laughs> so I learned how to differentiate a long time ago. I think it's an important thing. I think it's a great thing for secondary. I think the idea of having everyone in that room to share their feelings, to develop collaboration on concepts. I think the brightest student in the world can always gain from a student that has limited abilities because they might see something different and share that in a conversation. To limit that, to not have them exposed to that, for them to discover that later on in life because they, the world is differentiated. The world, you don't pick and choose and isolate. Most people don't, put it that way. I think one of the fears that I had at the beginning of this was my past experience on the board of a new program coming in, everyone getting excited about it, and then it falling by the way and not being supported. I am learning that we have good people at the very top not to say we didn't at the b before, but I trust them. And I honestly believe that if it isn't working, they're gonna let us know ahead of time and not let us discover it through an email from a parent that's upset. I wanna believe that. One of my questions I had put down is how are you going to let us know? That was answered in the presentation, going through the slides. I still am concerned. I want the support for the staff I don't think we should experiment with our children, but at the same time, I think a lot of questions that I've had have been answered. I'm willing to try. I'm basing that willingness coming from hearing the students themselves, seeing that they're in support of it. So I will be voting for this. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Um, so let me just res respond to Mr. Hain one of Mr. Hainer's comments first. Um, so there is other comment from students on social media in an anonymous fa fashion that is different. That's, I'll leave it at that. But um, we definitely are hearing from a lot of students who support this, but I think the ones who don't support it are feeling s social pressure not to, to openly comment in a way that may be perceived as racist or um, uh, unpopular. So I have a lot of thoughts about this, but I've had a lot of them at, at, at subcommittee level and, and have a lot of other members to speak. Um, so I want to address the concept and the process separately, although certainly they're related, since it's difficult to implement the best idea with a flawed process. So starting with the concept, I mean, I think the idea of grouping, heterogeneous grouping can address the disproportionate enrollment of some groups in curriculum A classes and create more inclusive classrooms although also revising the way students enroll role in these classes might, may, may have also had an impact. Um, while this is part of the process, the research has been oversold. There's significant research about the detrimental effects of tracking and labeling at lower grade levels, but very little at a high school level, particularly where students can choose their own levels. There's a lack of evidence of, uh, of, of disruptions or problems created by deleveling, de and there's a few promising case studies of high schools that have deleveled, but there are actually very few high schools that have undertaken this in a, in a, in a studied manner uh, that, that have produced results. Taken to its logical conclusion, though, the general rationales cited for heterogeneous grouping would lead to the eventual elimination of all honors, removal of AP classes, honors band and chorus, and even selective varsity sports. We need to think carefully about how, why, and when we need to group everyone together. Maybe ELA ninth grade is the right place, but we need to be careful. Despite many questions from the community, as I indicated tonight, there's been a lack of concrete examples of how instruction 
will be dis differentiated and we'll make sure that advanced topics are still taught in class and not assigned to independent study. Now to the process. I've been skeptical about this initiative because it didn't emerge from an equity audit, a root cause analysis of the achievement gap, or any, any other systematic assessment of, of issues in our district. It started in an emergency when COVID occurred. And the 2021 year was not a success. I, I understand our teachers feel that it was successful from their side of the screens, but our own ELA MCAS data that you show in your presentation showed that that year, the result of that year, produced a greater gap in e ELA MCAS between economically disadvantaged. It increased from 14% to 30%. So I don't know, you know, of course that could be from other factors, but I don't know how we can consider that year to be a success or the basis for anything. So rather than have an open process where we took an, a, a full review of the issue, we established a closed door subcommittee to specifically, and this is from the announcement, develop a pilot proposal for how we can move forward. There's been very little opportunity for public engagement. Only minor adjustments have been made to address the concerns that have come in. These latest ones are better, but still more, there still should be more. The forums have seemed mostly designed to sell the chosen pilot rather than to have a constructive dialogue. So changing something that has been done for decades requires careful planning and communication. And I don't believe we can accomplish this over the next five months, particularly the communication and feedback loops necessary to build community confidence in the implementation. If we wanna take another year to do more rigorous planning, to develop the methods that we're going to use to deliver this instruction uh, and come back with a proposal for that, then maybe I can support that, but I can't support this one tonight. Thank you. Mr. Slickman. Thank you. Back in 2004, we had three major tracks. That was the year that we got rid of the librarians. It was the same uh, crisis that we had when Mitt Romney cut our local aid by 20%. At that time, we got rid of the middle track. And what the proposal was, was that all those kids in that middle track, the ones who weren't in the high honors, were gonna drop down with the kids who were in the lower of the three tracks. And we had all sorts of barriers to get up into that honors. You had to have like a 92 average and recommendation of the T. It, it was a thicket of recommendations and requirements to get in. And it was a very exclusive thing. And we said, no, as a school committee said, no, we can't just dr drop everybody down. If we're going to eliminate that middle track, we've got to eliminate all those non-sequential uh, prerequisites. So that if you're taking French two, of course you need to take French one first. But if you decide you want to get into honors English three, and you looked at the requirements of what you need to be able to do to start it, and what you need to be able to do to succeed in it and said, yes, sign me up, you were signed up. And we had research to follow that because this was a emergency decision based on a, a local aid cut that came through in February and a failed override. We just had to make the decision to make it quickly. And the, we tracked every child whether or not they would have gotten the thicket of recommendations to get into honors. Had a lot more kids in honors, and guess what? If you were just looking at the classes, you couldn't tell the difference between the ones who met the thicket of recommendations and those who didn't. And in fact, some of the data showed in a couple of classes that the kids who didn't make the recommendations were performing at a higher level than the ones who were the, the high achieving kids who the teachers loved enough to get a recommendation to go into the very high honors class. Now, my experience as an educator, I, I've taught high school math, and I don't think anybody who's uh, here is talking about uh, uh, putting ninth graders in calculus AB. Uh, this is a very modest proposal involving ninth grade English. We are not going to go and, and bring this into calculus next year. Um, as an elementary teacher and a principal, I think I'm going for another little story here. 
in that at the Rogers School in Lowell, Massachusetts, we were opening up a school and we had four first grade teachers who were all new to teaching first grade, all new to the building. They were accomplished teachers in other grades, but they volunteered to come into this school because they had a surge in enrollment and all of a sudden they were put together. They were four wonderful teachers with four very different sets of uh, abilities and skills as teachers. And guess what? They had common planning time. They met at lunch. They spent a lot of time working together. And as a principal walking through the classrooms, all of a sudden I'd see something that was working really well in classroom one being tried in classroom three. And having that common planning time what sprouted better teaching. In, in an environment in which we had kids who were leveled in Fontes and Pinnell from levels A through F, and the teachers knew all the levels and were working to, to move kids all up through that. And it worked. It, it, it was a fantastic year. And if we can do that in first grade in Lowell, Massachusetts, with good teaching and common planning time and people who want to be together, we can do that in Arlington, Massachusetts in ninth grade English with good teachers who want to be together. The teachers want to do this. And I think that is the biggest recommendation for this project. This isn't us coming down and saying, you know, ninth grade teachers, you've got to change your ways. We're going to get rid of the honors tracks. We're going to put all the kids in one class. You, you, we can heterogeneously group them and you know, deal with it. No, that's not what we're doing. It's the opposite. The teachers want to do this. And in that context of the teachers saying that instruction and kid outcomes are going to be better by doing this in ninth grade English, I can't see sitting here and saying no. I think we have an obligation to stand behind the teachers who want to go and achieve more, who want to see their kids do more and achieve more, and say go for it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We come back and we look at the data and we figure it out. But with the enthusiasm of the teachers, and, and it sounds like we're taking our best teachers and moving them to grade nine, which is not usually the case in a high school. They all sort of float up to the upper grades. I think something really special can happen here. I'm voting yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Okay. I want to give some background on my thinking before we take our vote. You may note that I don't speak very much about equity, not because I don't feel this is important, but because I wanted to broaden the topics that are being discussed. The heterogeneous grouping initiative has been one of the hottest academic topics that we've, what? A little louder. Okay. In the room. <laughs> oh. Yeah, this is where Zoom actually works better for me. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone t hit your volume button. <laughs> Um, the heterogeneous grouping initiative has been one of the hottest academic topics we've discussed in years. We've heard from many, many families, students and teachers who are pro-HGI, many, many families and students who are against HGI, not, not so many students, but some, um, and many others who shared various concerns. Many potential benefits and many potential negatives have been cited. Behind all of this, what I've been hearing from families, especially those of high achievers, is a concern about the amount of differentiation in our students' education and the need for improving it. Improving differentiation is a conversation I would like us to be having at all levels, especially our middle schools. I'd like us to understand what successful differentiation looks like, how to facilitate it, and what additional supports our teachers need to effectively implement it. You know, what are we not giving them now that they need? The heterogeneous grouping initiative process was flawed in many ways, especially with regards to communication, both to us as school committee and to the public. By saying it was flawed, I am not trying to denigrate the work that the HEI committee did, nor imply a lack of gratitude for their significant work. They've pulled together a lot of useful information in a short time and given us something solid to work with, and for this, I thank them. However, although I feel the process was flawed, I do not feel it was fatally flawed, nor do I feel there has been a given in terms of the outcome. Speaking for myself, I was uncertain which way I would vote until the past couple, couple of days, despite spending hours sifting through the material. I also know there's been some frustration from various people, perhaps staff, regarding why the school committee has had so many questions about the HCI proposal. 
I hope these people can understand that we are hearing from the significant portion of the community that has expressed discomfort with this idea and trying to understand their concerns. For my part, I've been both listening to these concerns and trying to figure out how they can be addressed. Ultimately, I have decided to vote in favor of the initiative as it is presented to us tonight. It has gained several modifications that I needed before I could support it. A two-year pilot before consideration of expansion to other, other subjects, multiple progress reports, ability to address HEI in next year's budget proposal, and addressing counseling at OMS regarding levels. Um, additionally, I hope that CIA will be able to weigh in on the survey questions and the metrics for judging success, but I don't hold that as a requisite for my vote. There are several reasons why I support the HGI proposal. There will be clear benefits to our honors students. I single this group out because much of the concerns I've heard applies to them. These benefits include a closely re-exam curriculum with consistent grading and requirements across classes, level grade-wide, readily available additional instruction in writing mechanics if, mechanics if and when it's needed by these students, richer discussions in the classroom, and an exposure to all the, all the students. I mean, they've already seen them in OMS, but it's different when they're not seeing them as an other. You know, right now, after OMS, there's your classmates, but now they're an other. They're either honor, you know, they're either in the same class as you or they're a different one. And this won't happen. Um, a clear commitment to differentiation with administrative attention to whether and how it is happening. So you know, there's gonna be focus on what's going on in these classrooms. But most importantly, they'll have, these honor students will have enthusiastic and energized teachers. However, these benefits will not just apply to our honor students. They will be in place for all our students. In addition, this initiative will give a chance to begin some important conversations. What should honors mean in Arlington? From the other schools that um, were on the panels that were held in February, we heard honors can mean a lot of different things. Either it means you're getting good grades or you're, getting, you're doing an extra special project that's more difficult. Um, I personally don't like either of those as a definition of honors. I'm glad you folks kind of went with what you did, but it's, you know, what should that mean here? Um, another thing we can talk about is how can we support all our learners at the level that they need? How can we sure all our, ensure all our students feel included at all levels of academic achievement? I will be voting yes because this gives us a chance to explore all of these things and to build on the momentum created by our enthusiastic and energetic teachers. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I certainly respect uh, the hard work of uh, the heterogeneous grouping initiative and it looks like there's uh, enough votes to support the proposal. Uh, I will not be voting for it and I want to explain uh, my rationale. Uh, first, Arlington is a district that spends less per pupil than the statewide average. We are not Cambridge. We are not districts with more recent, like a district with more resources. And I do not believe we have enough resources in our budget right now to support this initiative the way it should be supported. I think there should be more teachers in the program and more teaching assistants. And that would make our classes smaller and easier to manage and make it more possible to reach all students at all levels. Next, I take exception to the process. We are having this conversation at the school committee level after we approve the budget and after we approve a program of study. We have no recourse to move things around in the budget to provide sufficient resources for this program. Uh, okay, next, third, this will be an experiment on 375 students in ninth grade at Arlington High, representing an entire year of their four years of high school. I suggested a smaller pilot. There wasn't uh, a, a movement on that at the school committee level or elsewhere, and I certainly accept that. 
some of those 375 students will have a better experience experience next year some will not i think it's just too large of a group to experiment on i've talked to as i mentioned earlier enough parents and some students who have stated that their children carry the burden of discussions in heterogeneous classes or honor students carry the uh, burden of discussions on the heterogeneous classes and that will continue i think under, under this model uh, ms perry has suggested that there are ways to um, prevent that and finally I, I think our biggest responsibility is to get out of the covid 19 uh, world that we're in to get our education system as normal as possible and then to rebuild our curriculum and so um, i don't think we're ready to do this i i think doing this right away next year next fall is too soon and so i can't support it but it looks like uh, i'm in the minority thank you miss morgan um, I also am not going to support the proposal as presented. Um, I think there was an opportunity here to really challenge the status quo and really think about teaching and learning in Arlington in English 9. Um, and I think that if that had been done with humility and compromise and um, a desire to really engage with the community, I think you could have come out with a stronger heterogeneous model and we wouldn't be sitting here moving forward with something with a 4-3 vote. And again, the will of the committee, it, you know, it, this, you, you can move forward with four and that's fine. Um, but I think that a lot, um, I think that this has been a, a shame to be honest, um, that there was an opportunity here to really evaluate what honors and curriculum a means um, there was an opportunity to think about you know why are why do we still have honors and curriculum a students right you're still going to have those next year um, and I, I suspect it may be more obvious in a classroom as opposed to on a zoom screen which students are taking the course for honors credit and curriculum a credit um, and you know, I, I I think that it's it's too bad that there is a willingness on the part of a very very new administration to uh, do something without the support of the community. Um, when you know there there were lots of opportunities to adjust um, and and work uh, to communicate and engage with people such that you know there could be more support for it so um i think that it's too bad um i support the intent of looking at heterogeneous classes i actually would have been far more likely to support a an english nine for all um that isn't the you know sort of uh embedded honors uh <laughs> pretend honors whatever we want to call it um a model that you know that that came out of the study group so anyway um i uh you know i i it, i hope i'm wrong i desperately hope i'm wrong i hope that it's a great success um i hope that uh you know you're able to find uh support uh for it among younger families and uh ninth grade parents next year and um that you know, this isn't the uh, topic of conversation going into an override. So I hope I'm wrong. Um, I hope that it goes great. And um, I'm, you know, looking forward to moving on to talking about other things. Thank you. Um, so my comments are a little more brief, but um, I, 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 I want to highlight that this proposal is for piloting heterogeneous classes in the high school for ninth grade English only. And so comments um, about you know, this being an experiment on freshmen um, or the entire class, they're t it's one of their disciplines um, out of four or five that they're taking. And the structure and the support that's been put in place for, for teachers is significant. Having four plus um, 
times a week that teachers have an opportunity to get together with one another, um, to align grading practices, to have access to a special education teacher is something that teachers in other grades and I'm sure in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade um, are very envious of. And I think that this is an incredible opportunity to lift the level of instruction for all of the teachers on every team by having so many opportunities to work together to observe one another, which was pointed out this evening. Um, and so I'm very excited about the the professional for professional development opportunity that this is going to provide for English teachers for their other classes as well. Um, we continue to hear questions about how the curriculum is going to be differentiated. And while I appreciate the committee's need for that kind of information, um, teaching is an art as much as it is a science. And I think that it's really difficult to explain very specifically mm -hmm. what differentiation looks like because mm -hmm. a really good teacher does it in the moment and it might look different on a different day for a different student because of how that student is responding um, to to what's going on in the classroom and so based on the the support and the advocacy from the English teachers from the administrators from educators throughout this community who feel very confident and excited um, about this opportunity. I'm, I'm really compelled by the educators both in Arlington and in other areas. We've heard from college counselors. We've heard from high school guidance counselors. We've heard from high school teachers in other districts um, that this having a two-year pilot specifically for ninth grade English um, I think is a really careful, thoughtful step in, in moving forward with this. There are many systems and structures that lead to inequities in student achievement in schools. There are many ways to address these inequities and piloting a heterogeneous grouping of students in ninth grade ELA is one of the ways that we can start to address these issues and examine our practices as a district. So with that, I will entertain a motion to approve so moved. heterogeneous grouping initiative proposal. So moved. Okay. So a motion by Mr. Schlickman, seconded by Mr. Hainer. Any other discussion? Okay. Roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Mr. Cardin? No. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? No. Ms. Morgan? No. And I vote yes. So that is a 4-3 vote to approve the heterogeneous grouping initiative proposal. Okay. Next on our agenda is superintendent's report. All right. Uh, Ms. Diggins, I need slides yep. shared. No, oh, well. did we miss them? Uh, Dr. Elmer. Oh, did I miss? Oh, yeah. sorry. Oh, yes. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Len. He, he, he. Just a thing. Um, sorry. Okay. Can we uh, take a five-minute break? Yeah. Yes. Can yes. We? Yeah. Can we? Do I have to? <laughs> no. Okay. We'll have a five-minute recess. Yeah. The appointment and approval of contract for Allison Elmer as assistant superintendent of student services. Can, I just, can I just verify that they can hear us? Because I haven't gotten a yes to Jane, that. can you hear us? Sure can. Okay. We yeah. can now. We couldn't before. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Chair. Mr. Hainer. I'm going to make a, a motion for discussion. Wait. Mm -hmm. I want to Dr. Holm wants to talk a little bit mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so as all of you know, as a component of the FY23 budget building process, I recommended um, and the school committee approved the restructuring of uh, special education student services to be housed in one office, overseen by an assistant superintendent of student services. This position addition was offset by the elimination of the position of director of special education and supplemented with the expansion of coordinators and team chairs in special education. Tonight, I'm recommending that the school committee appoint Ms. Allison Elmer to the position of assistant superintendent of student services. 
In this role, she would lead student services under one department to include counseling, social emotional learning, social work, special education, and nursing services. I want to speak to some of the reasons why I'm recommending this adjustment and for Ms. Elmer to take on this important role for the school system. Allison's strengths in the area of special education regulations and process are evident. Um, she, she knows and understands the law and she's able to explain it to those she supervises and her colleagues. She models this knowledge by sending out a routine communication, did you know, to all of her colleagues and her department. Um, and she educates everyone in the system on various aspects of special education um, and internal processes that will support all students and all students with IEPs. And these are the things that are fairly evident to us. However, I would like to focus on the strengths of Allison's that may not be as evident to the outside observer, but have been evident to me in my nine months in this role. First, Ms. Elmer is a systems thinker. She understands deeply how all elements of the school system impact the experiences of students with IEPs, and she advocates for adjustments to the system that will directly and indirectly benefit <coughs> students with IEPs. A couple of examples of this are her integral role in um, uh, facilitating some of our shifts in early literacy in collaboration with Dr. McNeil, introducing the impactful work of Dr. Melissa Orkin to the special education team first and influencing principals to take this work on with their classroom teachers as well. We've spoken at length about the positive impact of the work we've done in early literacy throughout the district. Allison has also put systems in place to support teachers through meeting students' needs in early intervention before referral to special education. This has resulted in more earlier intervention over the past several years, an expansion of resources in early intervention, and a better understanding among all stu school staff of how we can support students inclusively and early when they demonstrate challenges um, in order to bring them up to grade level. Ms. Elmer also understands the power and importance of strong relationships and collaboration within the system and with families. She has fostered a strong relationship with Special Educa Education Parent Advisory Council, she has listened to and acted on the concerns of other special education advocacy groups in Arlington. And I have personally witnessed interactions with families where Allison has exhibited compassion for a family's experiences, explained sped process and law in understandable terms for the family, and I've seen her meet routinely with principals and visit special education programs and classrooms in order to make sure that principals feel supported in implementing some of the adjustments that she's made to our system and in implementing students' IEPs. Allison empowers her staff to deal with challenges and conflict at the IEP team level and understands that the IEP team is the group best positioned to make decisions based on what they know about the student. She offers guidance to these teams and steps in only when needed to resolve conflicts productively and proactively. Also, Ms. Elmer is deeply committed to inclusive practices for all students and this has been evident not only in her actions, some of which I just described, but also in outcomes. She consistently focuses on the experiences and needs of students and advocates for them and the educators who support them in budget proposals and in discussions with her colleagues. She manages moments of conflict proactively and is able to receive, reflect, and act on critical feedback in order to improve the student and family experience, whether that feedback comes from me, from colleagues, or from families themselves. And I just wanna state a couple of outcomes. Since um, Ms. Elmer joined us, she joined us in 2014, but we only have this data back to 2016, um, in 2016, 64% of our students were in a full inclusion model, and in 2021, that number is up to 74%. In 2016, 72% of our students were in a full or partial inclusion model, and in 2021, that number is up to 81%. So she has significantly improved inclusion and the number of students, percentage of students who are in full or partial inclusion models in our schools. Also, since 2014, the percent of the total school budget dedicated to out-of-district tuition has decreased by 33%, with enrollment decreasing by 20%. And because we're able to keep more of our students in our district with their peers and our fantastic teachers is most, mostly because of the leadership that Ms. Elmer has demonstrated um, since she came on board. I also want to talk about um, the reasons for restructuring. At some point in their academic career with us, all students will access specialized services in our schools. As we rededicate ourselves to meeting the needs of all students, it seems an appropriate time to restructure our organization in a way that acknowledges that all of us work for all of our students. By placing nursing services, social emotional learning, counseling, and social work under the umbrella of student services, we're signaling that student services are not only about students with IEPs, but about all students and the services that we're able to provide them on short and long-term bases when they have a need that extends beyond the reach of the general education curriculum and regular programming. So this adjustment will expand the capacity of our special education department through the addition of team chairs at schools with programs and at Monotomy Preschool as Ms. Elmer takes on additional responsibilities. 
It expands the capacity of our assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction by distributing administrative leadership across those two offices. It also allows for a more seamless collaboration between student services and general education services with the collective understanding that all of our students will access services from both offices. And in short, like all adjustments to our system, this one is made in the interest of improving equity for our students and recognizing that all aspects of our organization are intertwined. It provides senior level leadership needed to move the system forward and distributes work across offices in order to improve the capacity of the system to better serve students. And I hope you will consider approving my recommendation for the appointment of Ms. Elmer to Assistant Superintendent of Student Services. entertain a motion to approve the appointment of Allison Elmer as Assistant Superintendent of Student Services. Mr. Hainer. So moved for the purpose of discussion. Second. Is there a second? Okay. Okay, seconded by Dr. Allison Anthe. Um, any discussion? Mr. Hainer. I've had uh, the privilege to work uh, with Ms. Elmer. We haven't always agreed, but it's been, uh, the disagreements have always been in a professional manner. And I was struck, uh, especially tonight, uh, hearing uh, both the chair and the co-chair of CPAC. Uh, I've had the privilege of being at CPAC meetings and uh, watching uh, Allison uh, in a very professional manner respond to concerns of parents. Uh, it's a, they're a tough group, uh, including their leader. Uh, but uh, it, uh, she's, done, she, she's done a phenomenal job in representing us and uh, the school, so thank you. Anybody else? Ms. Morgan. Um, since the uh, appointment was posted on the agenda and after we um, talked about it at executive session, I have been approached by um, some members of our staff and also from some members of the community as well as some parents who did um, express concern that this was a very um, high level position to be appoint to have as an appointment. Um, and they were concerned about, you know, the process for just, you know, appointing somebody for this as opposed to actually posting it and having a process and an interview committee. So I do think that, you know, I, I have heard that. I think that it's important to say that. I will be voting in favor of this. I think that, you know, I... I I think that largely personnel decisions should be left to the superintendent and then, you know, as a committee, we evaluate her based on how we feel she's made those decisions. So um, I will be supporting this, this contract, but um, I do, you know, it, th there has been some concerns expressed about how it came about. So thank you. I mean, we, we can have a discussion about administrative searches at some point as a committee, but um, I mean, it's obviously within the discretion of the superintendent. But I mean, we did have a, we did have a superintendent who almost always did an open search, but that's very unusual um, for administrative positions. There are a lot of other superintendents that simply pick a principal here, a uh, department head there, and you know, do it without a search, particularly when there's a, a good internal candidate. So I think we can have the discussion over that, but I have no criticism with whatsoever about this process. Dr. Allison Ampey. I just wanted to speak in favor both of the position, um, which way back when we were looking for new lawyers, actually, um, I did a lot of looking at and calling of different school districts around the Commonwealth. And I noticed that this, the position that we're talking about adding was found in almost all of these other school districts. and. At that time, I wondered why we didn't have it because looking at the description of their duties, it seemed like a very useful thing. Um, but, uh, and then I'd like to, so in, in support of adding this position and kind of balancing out our upper, our, our superintendent and assistant superintendent's workloads. Um, in terms of the process, I think this, I too have no problems with this particular process because I feel that the bulk of this job, the really most, the most important parts are the special education mm -hmm. uh, administrative duties and Ms. Elmer already fulfills those duties very capably. And <coughs> the idea of having an open search 
I don't think we would not have found a better candidate we would and we might have lost a good candidate so i think this was the best possible choice and is a great choice for us and i'm excited to hear how ms elmer sees her role going forward thank you mr slickman yeah i think that when we uh set forth the budget and looked at the reorganization that we knew we were going at that point. Um, and I think it's a deserved direction. Uh, I mean, the findings of the superintendent who's responsible for this ultimately, her enthusiastic support matters a lot to me in terms of putting together the team. And one of the things that I've been impressed with is how this team has gelled together over the past few months. Uh, and a lot through the superintendent's leadership. Uh, and it's not easy coming into a new district and putting it together. So I think that we sort of owe it to the superintendent to give her the people in the structure that she wants and to promote people and retain people who she thinks are an essential part of the process. because. I can talk to other people, but I don't see your performance day to day. She does. And it's her words that really count because our evaluation of her is based on what happens with her leadership team, with her principals, with her schools. So yeah, I mean, uh, this reorganization makes sense and if this is the reorganization we need to do, and the superintendent says this is the person for the job, we don't do a make-believe search. We, we put our person there and we make it work. I, I'm very appreciative of being able to cast an affirmative vote right now. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, roll call vote. Mr. Slickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Or Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. And I vote yes. So it's a unanimous. Do we need to and do we need to do a second for the con do we need to approve the contract separately? Do we need to approve yes. the contract the separately? Of the contract. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Second. Um, discussion? The, the motion needs we need a motion yeah. and it needs to allow you to talk. Authorize okay. the chair Authorize to sign. Okay. Do you want us? I move approval of the contract and authorize the chair to sign the contract. I second it. Okay. Motion by Mr. Cardin, seconded by Mr. Hayner. Okay. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Hayner. Yes. And I vote yes. Okay. It's unanimous. I have to say the vote. Congratulations again. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, superintendent's report take two. Okay, uh, Ms. Diggins, do you have the slides up for the, um, on the Zoom? On that Zoom? I don't believe that, Ms., that they can see it. I have an echo too. It needs to be shared on the computer that the Zoom is on. And we just lost Ms. Morgan. Why is it echoing? She oh, turned yeah. off her camera. Yeah, we have an echo. For 50 minutes, my car will be fully charged. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Where are you plugged in? Right downstairs. Oh. On the cooler court, there are four charging stations. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't touch anything. I don't think it did. I was just pulled, it was charged before that. So I didn't block his face. Well, you'd only be blocking his face from another group. Yeah, but it's not charged. I mean, it's charged. Well, no, if you're charging him, you sit there and not put it up. 
check out here at 50% and make sure that I was I wasn't know. fully charged because I knew I'd be here. Why not take advantage of this? Okay. I believe that everybody can see the slides now. Um, so this uh, is our latest COVID data. We do have an uptick, significant one in the community, uh, which is on the right-hand graph that I'm not sure if you can see all of. Um, but we do not see the same level of uptick um, in the school system. And so I just want to emphasize that a lot of the mitigation measures that we are taking um, are having a good impact, at least in the schools. We do still see cases in the schools. They are still increased compared to earlier in the fall. We continue to use the measures that we've had in place, which is to implement masking, um, require it in some cases, depending on the number of cases that we might have in a single classroom, strongly recommend it in other cases, um, do more cohorting. Um, but the, you know, there is a surge happening right now. And so we encourage families to take precautions and we have also um, asked families to have their student uh, take an antigen test on their return to, from April break uh, to make sure that we're isolating as many cases as we can before students come back into the classrooms. It has been wonderful um, to have a little more flexibility when it comes to masking and to be able to see students' smiles and faces in classes. Um, so we are enjoying that, but we're also making sure that we're keeping an eye on where cases are and responding as we need to in partnership with the health department, uh, the nursing department, and our principals. I wanna give a strategic planning update to the committee. Um, we have 62 community stakeholders that include students, families, administrators, community members who will be working with us to develop a vision, mission, and strategic plan. Um, I will be reporting on this at every superintendent's update and may even have it as a separate agenda item uh, when I need the committee to provide feedback on this over the next several weeks. Uh, we have seven meetings planned and the dates are there on the slide. We had our first meeting on April 12th where we met the facilitators um, and got an overview of the planning sessions, including the goals and objectives and pre-work needed to complete session one. Uh, what the committee is doing right now is going and reviewing a lot of data and we're adding to what they're reviewing um, in order to get a sense of some of the work that's already happened and is happening at the um, in the district and that includes a review of some of my entry findings and the entry findings report as well as a lot of that data, um, our panorama survey, data from the fall um, academic outcomes and um, HR, they have requested to take a look at our hiring and recruitment data um, and diversification of staff and our facilitators are very dynamic. Our first meeting was on Zoom. Um, so we only met for an hour just to get things launched, but the rest of our meetings will be in person. Um, we are very grateful for the support of the Arlington Education Foundation and uh, the fact that they have funded this effort means that we will be able to feed our participants, which is important, and also pay our participants, which we're very excited about. Uh, any participant who's over the age of 16 is eligible to uh, do this as work for us when we're um, really glad that we're able to do that because it increases access for everyone. Any students under the age of 16 who are participating with us will qualify to get community service hours and the students who are over 16 can also opt to get that as their compensation instead if they would like. Um, this maps out the work that the, the committee is going to be doing. Um, we will have drafts available for visions as we go and I will also share some of the documentation that comes out of this process with the committee as we move forward. I have a few other updates to share with the committee. Um, we had three Audison National History Day projects make nationals, um, and that's very exciting. They will be going to the national competition, and we had a lot of students who made the state competition. Seven projects made the state competition. Um, and our teacher at Audison, Jason Levy, who runs the National History Day program, was nominated as National History Day Teacher of the Year. So congratulations to him, and we'll keep you posted on whether or not he wins that national award. Um, we had a spectacular production of the Who's Tommy at the Mosesian Center in Watertown last weekend. Um, the musical group did a fantastic job. They uh, encountered a couple of challenges along the way, not uh, including the fact that they had to perform not in our own auditorium but at our own high school and had to get everything over to uh, Watertown um, and the fact that they just really have put a ton of work into this and they did a very, very wonderful job with that performance. Um, we, there was a presentation on early literacy done for the Special Education Parent Advisory Council recently. A number of our administrators as well as uh, literacy specialists and coaches 
uh, went to present that and we got some excellent feedback from um, and positive feedback as well as additional questions from members of the CPAC and we're looking forward to visiting again um, before long. I'm, I believe I shared the um, slides with the school committee that we had, that our administration had shared with the parents. We uh, will be going on a Deeper Learning Dozen in-person conference, those of us on the Deeper Learning Dozen team, and just as a reminder, that includes Ms. Elmer, um, <coughs> Dr. McNeil, uh, Margaret Thomas, our director of DEI, and uh, Thad Dingman, um, our, one of our principals, and that group will be going to British Columbia in May. We're very excited about the first in-person opportunity to engage with Deeper Learning Dozen. We joined this back in the fall. Um, and we've been virtual since then. There was a plan to go to San Diego in February, but that got um, obviously delayed because of the Omicron surge. So we're looking forward to that. Um, we are in the middle of the equity audit. We're really enjoying the process. It's very participatory. There is a group of stakeholders who are reviewing a lot of the same data um, that the Strategic Planning Committee is working on, and we're looking forward to having a report from the equity audit in mid-May. Uh, the group is engaging with all sorts of groups of stakeholders in the district, including uh, doing a group of principals um, and working with the central office team this past week. They're also going to meet with curriculum leaders next week, and they're doing interviews with students. They visited classrooms this week. They were here for three days uh, visiting schools as well. Um, we also have the elementary literacy core team that is getting its work started. They will be doing an audit of the uh, landscape of literacy instruction at the elementary level and taking a look at our core resources um, and what teachers would like to see in a potential new core resource uh, and they are very excited to get that work started. Dr. McNeil is leading that. Um, Ms. Elmer is part of that effort as well as Ms. Perry and we're really looking forward to seeing the feedback that we get from teachers um, and other uh, educators in our elementary schools so that we can begin the work of taking a look at resource options next fall. So really what this group is doing this, um, this spring is developing a set of criteria that we will use to take a look at new resources um, and it will help us understand sort of the landscape of what we're gonna need and we can get feedback from teachers of what they're gonna need in order to be able to implement whatever we choose well. Um, you also have enrollments in your folder and it's not on the slide but we are doing a number of administrative searches uh, in addition to uh, the um, the one leader director of social studies, uh, he, uh, Mr. Conklin, was recently appointed as the assistant superintendent in Dover Sherborne, and we're very happy for him and excited for him on this next chapter and very sad for Arlington because he is a spectacular leader and he's done wonderful work for the social studies department. So we will be searching for a new director of history and social studies and wishing Mr. Conklin the best on his next adventure. We're also looking for um, a director of visual arts, a director of wellness, the director of wellness and uh, is currently a point two and is retired and is re-retiring. Same is true for Director of Visual Arts. Um, and we're going to make those positions as part of the FY23 budget um, a 1.0. Director of Visual Arts, that 1.0 will come in part out of the um, reserve funds um, because we want to our leaders to be full-time administrators, especially given enrollment increases over the last several years. So those are searches that are happening as well as a coordinator uh, for the high school because our high school special education coordinator was recently appointed assistant superintendent of student services where, Ms. Elmer? In, in Maskinomet. Um, and I believe those are the administrative, oh, and we will also be doing an administrative search for the assistant principal at Brackett because she was recently appointed as a principal in Reading. Um, so we're looking forward to finding an assistant principal for the Brackett School as well. So folks moving on to wonderful and amazing new opportunities um, and we're sad to see them go and looking forward to updating you on those searches as they move forward. And with that, I'll take any questions that you have. Dr. Allison Ampey. I have questions about the um, projection enrollment data. Mm -hmm. uh, Mainly, I'm wondering two things. One is the comparison that we're given for the current year, is that the October 1 numbers or is that as of today or you know whatever the date is? That is October 1. Okay. Um, Hold on, I'm double checking on it. I wasn't sure because they look pretty similar. I mean, I didn't go through and do everything, but the two reports look the numbers, anyway, so that, that's one question. 
um, and the second is, is it possible to add a line at the bottom so that we get numbers with and without Menominee Preschool? Because right now, Menominee doesn't have any numbers attached to it. So actually, we are up, next year is projected to be up in terms of total enrollment mm -hmm. if you allow for Menominee being pretty stable. Mm -hmm. And right now, it doesn't look like it because of the way that's put. So if there could be some way of adjusting, mm -hmm. that, that would be helpful. Yes, that's absolutely possible. And I am reasonably confident that those, I wanna double check, but that those 2021 numbers are October 1 numbers because they're not exactly the same as the numbers for right now okay. in this school year. Okay. But yeah, I will double I check that and get back to you. Okay, I, I just look careful, I mean, mm -hmm. quickly. Yeah, it'd be good. I think it should be October 1 numbers. Yes but I just couldn't tell. So, thank you. Mr. Cardin. Uh, if we're looking to improve that, um, you, you also probably should make an adjustment to grade nine at AHS, because we know they're not gonna be 400, 439 students there next year. Yep. I know it's a guess at this point, but. Um, yeah, this is a, the way that this data pulls from PowerSchool is it pulls the student next grade information for the current students and assumes a full matriculation, but you're right that that's not a full matriculation at grade nine. So I'll just have to think about where we pull that projection from in order to correct that. Do you have a field in there to, p uh, the, to tag kids who are designated for Minuteman? I'm not sure. Hmm. I'll have to look. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 22220, dated 4 5 2022, in the amount of 809. 809,834.15 and school committee regular meeting minutes March 31st, 2021. Can I get a motion? So moved. Mr. Hainer. Second. Second, Dr. Allison Ampey. Vote, Mr. Slickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I vote yes, it's unanimous. All right, policy, second read, and possible vote on policies BDA, BEDB, BID, AC, ACR, and JICK. Mr. Sikmi, you wanna? Unless somebody asks to divide the vote, I'm gonna move to approve uh, the six policies before us tonight. Okay, motion. So moved. Uh, I, I made oh, the motion. You so. made the motion. Sorry. Sorry. Second. second. Okay. Um, any discussion? Okay. Um, roll call vote. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I vote yes. It's unanimous. All of those policies are approved. Okay. Subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Uh, budget. I ha these are the old people, the old uh, subcommittee chairs for tonight, and then I know, right? Old. Um, and we'll change that. Sorry. <laughs> Nothing to report. Okay. Uh, community relations. Um, there is a Metco school committee chat on Saturday, April 30th at 11 a.m., and the Zoom link will be on the APS website. And um, Ms. Smith, the, re the Metco director will share that information directly with the Metco families. Uh, curriculum, instruction, assessment, and accountability, Mr. Cardin? Uh, no report. Facilities, Mr. Thielman? No report. Policies and procedures, Mr. Schlickman? As discussed at the last meeting, we've got some unfinished business, so uh, once we get back from vacation, uh, we got some work to do. Uh, Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman? We meet next on um, May 3rd, I think it is. Um, that's all I have to report. Liaison reports. Uh, announce. Announcements, Mr. Hainer. 
I'm happy to report at the EDCO board uh, this morning, uh, all members of EDCO, and I do mean all members, uh, have uh, committed to pay uh, their assessments and uh, the lease. Uh, so dissolution seems to be going forward without any uh, more problems and things look positive. Thank you all. Thank you. Future agenda item. Sorry, I did have oh, an, so, an oh, announcement. Sorry. Mr. Cardin. Also liaison point. Um, so the AEF is sponsoring its first uh, 5K race. Uh, they're taking over the race that was run by prior organization that I'm, I'm blanking on. Um, anyways, uh, so uh, signups are going fast. I think there's less than 100 left. So if you're interested in running in the race, uh, please sign up. Uh, you can look at the AEF website for more information. Thank you. Future agenda items? Okay. Uh, so we will now be going into executive session. We will not be returning uh, to public, to open session. Um, can I get a motion to enter executive session? Mr. Schlicker. I move that we enter executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in w it, which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect and to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted and uh, for AEA and or AAA negotiations update. Thank you. And a second. Second. Seconded by Mr. Cardin. Roll call vote. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Amphi? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay. We are entering into executive session.